The podcast on Haunted Hill will contain spoilers and swearing. I am the devil, and I am here to do the devil's work. I saw this light go. Be one of us. I didn't tell you my name. Hang up. I didn't tell them my name. Hello and welcome to the podcast on Hort Hill 116 episode. Uh, I am Gav, this is Dan. Hello. Um, Merry Christmas! Merry Christmas our Christmas right. episode. Good like Christmas. Father Christmas comes down the chimney, we are both coming in your ears. Wow. Merry Christmas, you all. Um, I hope you're sitting well, whatever you're doing. If you're working and standing, you're standing. Obviously not sitting, standing. If you're dancing, you're dancing this to us. If you're swimming with some sort of underwater, waterproof headphones in your ear, you're still listening to us, so thank you, thank you. You could be having sex right now, if you are, fantastic. We've said this before, do you think people have sex to us? There's probably people out there that listen to podcasts and have sex at the same time. Or, by accident, you might have, on. like, shuffle on, Ooh. and you've got, like, some love And you don't on. notice, and it just comes on. And then suddenly it's like, hi, and welcome to episode four of the podcast on Haunted Hill, back when we had terrible production, and you're, like, in the mid-sort of thrust... And you've got us sort of talking about something terrible. Or mid-ejaculation. That would be even worse, wouldn't it? Yeah. Right. <laughs> well, it's Merry Christmas. We're emptying our sacks already. Um, oh, dear, <laughs> oh, dear. Ho, ho, ho. Ho, ho, ho. Ho, 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 ho horror. Uh, and ho, ho, Christmas. And I've got hoes in different area codes. Um, I imagine most of the early years, because our first, because congratulations, our happy anniversary. Yes, it's our eighth year of podcasting, really, because we started uh, eight years ago. It was a December, eight years ago. We did our very first ever um, episode of the podcast on Haunted Hill, and it happened to be a Christmas special. We got a bit drunk and we covered, well, in fact, I can tell you what we covered, because I've put together, thought you might want to know this, before we cover, talk about what we're covering, actually, let's talk about what we're covering in this episode, and then I'll tell you what we've done for each Christmas special over the years. Would you be interested? Yeah, and I was going to say, quite often we've played, well, twice, we've played Randy MC's Christmas in Hollis. We're not allowed anymore, though. Yeah, against YouTube violations. Um, and but, Spotify, the old Spotify as well. Um, it, yeah, but it's good to just, uh, yeah, so we don't. We could do our own version. No, we won't, though. No. no. But we are covering... Nobody wants to hear it. Go on. No. We, we are covering uh, a relatively new film called The Wolf of Snow Hollow, which dropped last year, um, which we'll talk about. We'll talk about We'll talk about it. It's a werewolf detective thriller. Oh, Dan. We'll get, we'll, we'll get more into that. Oh, yeah. Real quickly, uh, what did Santa do when he went speed dating? Oh, here we go. Go on, then. What did he do? He pulled a cracker. You, you carry on. You carry on. <laughs> so we're doing The Wolf of Snow Hollow, which was a 2020 movie. And because a few years ago we covered... And there's no denying that Die Hard is a Christmas film. So fucking shut up if you don't think it is. Although, please don't stop listening to the show if you disagree. But, yeah. So this year, we thought, let's come back to a bit of John McClane. We're doing Die Hard 2. Amazing. Die Harder. <laughs> Which sounds like a, could be could be a porno. It sounded. I never thought about it until the way you just said it. You had a slight tinge of porn in your voice <laughs> tone there. That is something I tinge get told a lot. Tinge of smut in the tone there. Die harder. Die harder. Die hard with a vengeance. With a vengeance. Good day to die hard. <laughs> <laughs> yep. Die hard for play. No four point oh. Sorry, I got that one wrong. Um, yes. So that's what we're covering. Die hard two. Die. Harder and Wolf of Snow Hollow. So Christmas, Christmas, Christmas. Before we get into all the festivities, yeah, let's let's congratulate ourselves. This is um, eight years, pretty much. We've we've skipped a few Dan, months here and there. Dan, Uh-oh, who, here we go. who hides in a uh, bakery? 
at Christmas? Uh, I, I don't know. A mince spy. A mince spy. Oh, God. I asked Gav to come prepared with cracker jokes, cheesy Christmas jokes, and it sounds like he's pulling them out of the bag for us in this episode. But that's good. So let's let's turn the clock back to 2013 when we were much younger, less grey, mm. maybe maybe more hair, certainly less children. In different areas. Different areas. What, children? Hair. <laughs> children in different areas. Hairy children. All around the country. Just hairy children. <laughs> <laughs> so, 2013, we kicked off our, our uh, legacy. I don't know if you want to call it that. <laughs> of podcasting. I with, think that's um, your ego talking. With Rare Exports, which is a fucking phenomenal yeah. movie. And we, we paired that up with the classic jack frost not the michael keaton romantic sort of tear-jerking comedy this is the cheesy terrible horror film called jack frost about a killer snowman the kid, so that... That, kid that gives his dad a flask of a uh, uh, uh um <laughs> antifreeze. antifreeze yeah he says there you go dad and he's like, oh thanks son and he goes to drink it and then luckily he spills it on the ground yeah. and he says why did you do that and his little boy's like because it's supposed to be cold today dad and i i thought you might want to drink antifreeze you almost killed your fucking dad yeah. you yeah. silly little kid so yeah well remember that guy. all i remember from that film though i watched it again last year i think it's on youtube so i watched it again last year it's still silly fun um 2014 we did a film which i watched the other day actually Santa's sleigh with yeah. the wrestler Goldberg as a demonic Santa riding around town, killing people. Uh, fun film, silly film. Mm. It's on Amazon Prime. Go watch it. Yeah, I saw it was on there. UK Prime. That is. We also we paired that one up with a Dutch film called Sint. I love Sint. It's a great film. I'm Although a fan there's of it. a bit few bits in it now which people are saying are controversial because they've got the oh um, god yeah they've got those guys who do the black face yeah yeah Yeah, but it's like a traditional old dutch thing i'm not saying it's right i'm just saying they're not like fully going black face for it but i assume that that's uh, not something that's done anymore probably not talking of which in 2015 black christmas (laughs) but not (laughs) segway dan (laughs) segway (laughs) this was the original bob clark um black christmas 1974 love this film I that's love what it. we covered uh, the, for our... the recent one yeah we covered it for an issue recent ones just come on netflix yeah and funny enough bo ranzel i've not uh, bothered watching then i won't bother watching bo ranzel has started a new podcast shout out to bo and his new podcast the dark parade where he's looking at film franchises he's I done like, on like, like the demons you were you did you helped out on psycho didn't you mm. um and he's recently he's never seen black christmas oh any god film. So he watched um, Black Christmas 1974. I haven't heard his review yet. It hasn't come out yet. And then he's done the two remakes, one which came out in like 2009. Oh, good. I'll, I'll listen one, to them. And one which came out pff, like a year or two ago. I've seen them all. The yeah. most recent one is yeah. now on Netflix, and it is fucking terrible. Okay. There's, there's no point in watching it at all. Absolutely no point. But yeah, so in 2015, by this point, it was our third Christmas special. We got into a bit of a habit of gathering around your flaming big open fire, mm, mm, getting a little anymore. bit drunk yep. and um, chewing our way through podcasts. Got some comments from listeners saying, probably don't eat your nuts too close to the microphone in the next one. But yeah, yeah. I've had comments from people not to eat when, yep. when podcasting. So yeah, that was what we did in 2015. We paired that up with a relatively new film um, called A Christmas Horror Story, which is an anthology starring several people but one of whom is uh william shatner as a radio dj narrating what's going on in this weird town full of christmas stories it's I, a great film i don't remember the film you should definitely go back and watch it okay. uh, it's a really fun film if you if it reminds me of big woolly jumpers a bit like the woolly town clan christmas jumper you're wearing right now gav uh eggnog and uh gav's doing a Wu tang sign at the moment Yep. There we go. Brilliant. So that was 2015. We skipped 2016. Not sure what happened. I think it might have been during our time where everything went to shit uh, for us both personally. But 2017, we came back and we did a hell of a cracking movie. Better watch out, which uh, I know is a big favourite. A lot of people love that one. We, uh, you were with me, didn't we? Didn't we see that at Fright Fest? 
We did. Yes, you're right. So we saw, we saw the that. UK premiere of it. The Summer Fright Fest. We should watch that with our Jamie Creedy, didn't we? Yeah, I still... Um, I don't know if I still have it or not. I might have got rid of it. I had the candy cane from it, the promotional candy cane on it. I've still got mine. Have I would you? not eat I it. I don't not eat it. I, would not, not, I don't think I ate it. I might just throw it at there. RJ said to me it's one of the most surreal experiences of his life because he'd only met us a couple of times. He wasn't podcasting by this point, And he arranged to just meet us in London for Fright Fest and went to watch... A Christmas horror film with me and you in the summer. In the but it wasn't just the summer; it was a, such a hot day, wasn't it? It was so hot. Yeah. But yeah, that was fun. Enjoyed that, and we paired Better Watch Out with Die Hard. Yay! So that was you know that was t- uh, touched on then, and then following year 2018, we did Krampus and Gremlins, two creature features, one classic, one new. And I still really love Krampus. I think it's a great film. I think it yeah. gets better with every watch. I, I, there's a director's cut coming out, which I, 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 I've heard a bit more footage. So I'd like to check that out. Yeah, I might have to purchase it. Uh, and then 2018, sorry, 19, we did a film called Secret Santa, which you chose, which is a very low budget film about a family that gets together for Christmas and someone's poisoned the punch with oh, yeah. um, like bath salts and they all start like oh, killing each movies. other. We paired that one up with Lethal Weapon. <laughs> oh. <laughs> Amazing. I love that we're sne- sneaking in our, our cult action. <laughs> yeah, if it's really Christmas, like. it's allowed. Uh, and last year for 2020, we did Silent Night, Deadly Night, the 1984 horror film about the killer Santa. And we paired that up with the Bill Murray classic Scrooged. Um, and then, yeah, that takes us up to this year. And as I've said, we're doing Wolf of Snow Hollow and we're doing Die Hard 2. Santa's favourite singer, Elf is Presley. Oh, for fuck's sake. So, Gav, are you excited for Christmas? Um, yeah and no. I don't get as excited as I used to be. If you listen to the early episodes, you just get more excited. I don't so much anymore. Um, but I do have the kids with me this year. Um, so I've got a little tr- a little tree. My mum lent me a little tree because I didn't have anything. And um, that's why I, I, was, tree, yeah. I wouldn't bother decorating it if I didn't have kids. I'm, I'm not that really fussed. I'll just carry on as normal, really. It's no, no thing for me. But we, we for have you, got a tree. it's We've your got a first tree. Christmas with your little ones. It, it is, if... but but for that reason, mm-hmm. like I say, we, we haven't got a tree. We weren't, we're not going to bother because Jack can roll now, and he rolls. He's like a little demolition steamroller. Uh, dude, you, you're so busy. I really wouldn't worry about it if you can't. It, do you know what I mean? It's not a problem. In a couple of years' time, you'll want to do that. Yeah. Um, well, I, I figured. Next year, in fact. I figured I wouldn't put any decorations up. Actually, over the course of the last couple of weeks, I have found the time to put up. I'd say about seventy-five percent of the decorations we normally have up. Yeah. Um, well, you know, I'm you know. I'm forty-five in January. Like I'm mid middle-aged, which is a weird thing to say because I don't feel like it. And um, just I guess I'm kind of like well, I've done Christmas many years now. So again, I was always thinking why my granddad used to do it. So, like I get to the end of the Christmas Day, Christmas Day night as a little kid, granddad under his chair, all of his presents still. He hadn't opened any of them every <laughs> year because it's just like. <sighs> whatever it's the stuff what's the point um right. yeah yeah totally so and my dad's like that now so don't give me anything i don't want anything my dad say it every year so so now i'm doing like a hamper thing i go and buy him loads of fucking snacks and i'll buy him a couple of westerns on dvd and there's some bottles of booze so he said can sit there for a couple of days just fucking munching and shit you know? i love a good hamper i love some cheese exactly some that's wines. the sort of thing nowadays because it was it's instant like like nice oh brilliant wicked um consuming and stuff so you know um but i can understand that i can understand so you've got the kids for christmas and your you do your christmas dinner you what did you say you're going to mums no no my uh, i'm just making the food for myself and the kids here um uh, it'd be different meals though because all the kids eat different things it won't be just like traditional turkey or nothing it'd be different stuff um so yeah i don't know what it'd be but yeah i've got that what are you doing you're you're, uh, yours we are having Christmas morning here with the babies. They won't have a clue what's going on because they they'll only be sort of seven or eight months by then. Yeah. Um, but, you know, they like the bright lights and the sparkling things and the ringing bells. So they're happy with all of that. We bought them some presents, which you will can, open for can, them. You can literally give them some uh, wrapping paper and they will be absolutely like a pig and shit. Do you know what their favourite um, toys are at the moment? What? A wooden spoon. Yep. And a mashed potato whisk. Oh, yeah. A mashed potato, like just a whisk itself. How amazing would that we, be? Uh, we've spent hundreds of pounds on toys and products for them. Oh, no, no, yeah. And I've given them two fucking things at the kitchen and they just love them. 
Apart from the fact that Edith got a black eye from Jack because he was wielding the wooden spoon a little bit too mm. crazy. So she got a black eye. That was bad. But yeah, so after Christmas morning's done and dusted, we are going over to my dad's. Uh, is, is, is this for the podcast listeners or are you just telling me what's going on? I'm just, we're just discussing Christmas. We like to get into the spirit and tell people what we're up to. And then uh, my dad's selling the family home, so it'll be the last Christmas in the family home. Okay. Um, but it won't be my usual piss to sleep by about three or four o'clock in the afternoon because I've got two children now, so none of that. No. But yeah, that, that's, that's Christmas this a, year. A reindeer that can't see, what is it? Um, oh, I've got no idea. Can you help me? Oh, fuck off. You, I must say that you're doing this very well. Thanks. Well, Christmas, talking of Christmas, just thought I'd mention a couple of brand new Christmas horror films that our listeners may... We never really do this, but I thought, you know what? Well, let's tell you... Let's tell you what's out in 2021, Christmas. Yeah, well, it's weird nowadays because there's so much shit all the time and it moves so fast... Like Ferris Beauty said, if you don't stop and look and listen at it, all, you, you're gonna miss it. And like, when movies come out now, boom, they're fucking, they, even if in the cinema, boom, it's gone. You know, it's so, so quick. So the shit just goes past me. And if you're not keeping up on social media all the time and stuff, unless it's a movie which everyone's like, this is amazing, like, and then like, it becomes like a massive hashtag or a massive fucking thing for a couple of days. You've gotta see this, see it immediately. It, or something. I don't know. No, I did. You know what? Recently, I think I did see a picture of something because like a, a Christmas horror movie. I thought, oh, that looked kind of good. Gone now of my mind because there's so much other shit's just gone in my mind off social media. Do you know what I mean? So, um, what's come out? Is there a few things? Is it good yeah, stuff? there's there's two or maybe even three. Um, there's one called Silent Night with Kira Knightley, um, which is well, a she, horror she's a, she's comedy a bit, thriller. Oh wow, she's a little bit more of a up there actress. So yeah, that might be a higher production than. So that's coming out in the cinema uh, very soon. Uh, it says, the synopsis is, Now Simon and their son Art are ready to welcome friends and family for what promises to be a perfect Christmas gathering. Perfect except for one thing. Everyone is going to die. So it might be a better produced, bigger budgeted version of that one that we talked about, Secret Santa, where the family get together and all get killed off. I don't know. Yeah, maybe. Wait, but yeah, so. so that's one of the ones that's out. There's another one which we've talked are about. These, are these films which are out now? They're coming out. What's that's coming out in the cinema very soon. This 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 Christmas. This Christmas. Oh, okay. This cool. is a, yeah. uh, there's also one called Toys of Terror, which I think some of us have seen the trailer for. It came out maybe over the summer, and it's a Christmas movie about toys. It's like Toy Story but horror. Um, looks very low budget, and this is this will be out streaming. And this is a 2021 movie, Toys of Terror. I'll tell you the synopsis. Just before Christmas, Zoe and her brother and their family moved to a secluded mansion with a dark past. The adults focus on renovating the place, but the bored kids find a toy chest hidden in the attic and are delighted when the toys inside comes alive. But bizarre events soon take place. Events that threaten everybody's lives. Okay, sounds all right. Yeah. You know, it could be okay. Why can't Christmas trees knit? Oh, Jesus. Oh, I know this one. They keep dropping their needles. Yeah, they lose their needles. Uh, yeah, well, you know, similar. There's another one, one other film coming you could, out. You could say, like, why Christmas trees can't shoot heroin, couldn't you? You could make it real dark. They keep or you could say, what is Amy Winehouse? What's Amy Winehouse and Christmas trees got in common? Keep losing needles. They sort of droop over and die just after Christmas. That's and not the leave joke. Needles lying all over the place. <laughs> Very good singer. Yeah, but massive crackhead. Um, Snowman, Snowman, cross with a vampire. Go. Frostbite. Damn. I'm a dad joke, man. Um, <laughs> I'm a dad joke, man. Not a word, uh, man, man. <laughs> the last one that's coming out on Prime Video uh, this Christmas is Red Snow. A struggle. Funny enough, you just mentioned this. A struggling vampire romance novelist. What? A vampire romance novelist must defend herself against real life vampires during Christmas. So she is like misery. She goes away to write in a little secluded snowy cabin, and then actually vampires do come and attack her. I thought it meant when it said vampire romance novelist. I thought it meant she's a vampire who happens to be a novelist as well. Fucking hell! That would be brilliant. 
Mur- Murder, she wrote. I want to see Jessica Lansbury as a vampire. Angela Lansbury. Whatever. Jessica Fletcher is the character. See? Mixing it up, ain't I? Mixed nuts. So that's that's what, if anybody wants to see a new Christmas horror film, there's three out this year, and I've just told you what they are. Talking of films, what have you been watching? Hit me. Hit Sor- me in the face. Sorcerer. R- William Friedkin. <clears throat> oh, yeah. Uh, he had made Exorcist, then he uh, d- didn't know he, he'd done that, and a French connection, he wanted to make something different. Um, and he decided to go to a jungle and uh, make a movie which 50 members of the crew all got jungle poisoning and shit and just craziness have you ever seen the film no can we please cover it can you just write it down and we just cover it just trust me of course for, I heard for a- conversationally yeah Sarah Sarah fell asleep a little bit before it. Um, she's quite tired anyway but I don't think it's her bag but uh, there's a couple of scenes in it where my toes were curling like there's some, there's some chatter on the Legion um, page, Facebook page about this recently because I know that Duncan again, Duncan and Bo did. They just dropped a seven-hour episode where they review every single William Friedkin movie. Oh wow! And okay. they talk about. And a few people were saying Sorcerer. Someone said, I can't remember who. Sorcerer is my favourite movie ever. I think. Uh, it, yes, yeah, it's, it's um, Stephen King's favourite film, wow. and Quentin Tarantino is one of his. Um, okay, now I need to check this out. Uh, I just happened to be in a shop and I saw it on Blu-ray. Um, it's ten bucks, but I was like, you know, I'm gonna, I'm gonna definitely. I always said I want to watch it. And then I was thinking, oh, I could just vlog it if I don't like it. You know, it's not. I just still wanted to see it, just pick it up. And um, actually, it's pretty decent. It's it's just bit. It's just. Do you know? Do you know what it's about? Mm-hmm. Oh, very very. Nope. Just. I do, do a little bit. Four guys who are from different parts of the world who have done things and they're trying to escape from their what's going on. Not generally really good things, really. Um, uh, they end up in the same sort of village, um, and in I can't remember where, what, what country it's from. That's terrible of me. I should really known. Don't know. People are screaming at the uh, podcast right now. Um, and ah, and them. essentially, they just got a, uh, they they just take dynamite in two trucks through the jungle, and it, if anything gets bumped, uh, it blow up. So the dynamite's cases are in sand in the back of these jeeps. Jesus. That's it. Um, and yeah, my toes, this does not my toes like... were curling because I was just like, fuck it. Because it's, it's real filmmaking. There's, there's no CGI going on. And it's So when, like, you, when you say Sorcerer, like the title Sorcerer, I'm thinking of like... I've, I, do, the first time I ever discovered it was because I thought it was Sword and the Sorcerer. Remember that fantasy film? Yeah, I thought it when was, was going to be like... What's that one? Warlock. I thought it'd be like so, Warlock you'd or something. Think so no, one of the one of the jeeps is um, trucks is uh, called Sorcerer. Fuck. Okay. Wow. Uh, it's just like what the fuck. It's four different languages spoken it, and Roy Schneider's the main actor. Oh yeah. Um, but they want, it did want Steve McQueen actually. Anyway, so Rob just Schneider. Did you say Rob Schneider? Uh, not Roy. No, Roy, stop it. Roy Schneider. <laughs> stop the stop putting words in my mouth. Robert Downey Jr. is in it, right? Got you. And I watched Ghostbusters in the cinema, and I'm upset if you can't see it. I'm watching it tomorrow morning. Yes! Yeah! Uh, I'm I, so happy. So, as we record this, it's a Friday night. So, tomorrow my day is I've got a four hour window where I'm going into town, I'm getting a coffee and some sweets, and I'm going to go and sit down and watch a matinee showing of it. Um, I think you are doing a little uh, tear water, eye I think, water. I think I will. I know a lot of people have said this. Oh, I did. Yeah, so um, I've got a very good morning lined up. So I'm really excited because the restrictions are coming back in. Not to talk about stuff that, you know, dates, uh, timestamps the podcast, but restrictions are coming back in. And I don't really want to sit in a cinema with a mask on for two, two and a half hours. You don't have to do that, actually, though. Plan B is you will have to do that in theatres and cinemas. In because you never used to do that, even if you had to wear a mask. It's only in the foyer. That's that's what Plan B is now. Boris Johnson has brought in Plan B. So the only time you don't need to wear a mask is if you're in a restaurant or a pub at a table, but in a cinema or a theatre you have to wear a mask, which is shit. That's so. gonna stop people wanting to go. It doesn't make me want to go unless it's yeah. a movie I really well, my, see. With Ghostbusters, my, I really, granted you should see that. So my glasses will steam up, you see, as well. So yeah. Um, well, no, you just have to adjust it so you can do it. But anyway, I'm I'm going to see it tomorrow morning. So, but I know you're very excited because you've seen it. And... I'm not going to tell you much about it. Um, it's a really nice 
it's it's a, obviously a new cast. It's younger people and stuff, but I think it's brought in very well with uh, um, Thingamajiggy. What's he called? Who's in that Halloween movie? The one who's a little Ant Man. Oh, Paul Rudd. He's good. Good to have in it. I feel like um, because he oh, gives it a bit more of um, the funness of the original Ghostbusters. He's a sort of same age. Do you know what I mean? And he brings Somebody, sort of to I it. was listening to a spoiler-free review of it, and they were saying that. There's a there's a real eighties feel go, to you it. You shouldn't listen to anything. You should just go in. No, it, it was a spoiler free review, and they were saying that it was a real eighties yeah. feel to it, like the it, feel of that magic of an eighties film it, is in it. It it's very much feels like a uh, a movie from the eighties because of the way it is. It just it's out in the middle of nowhere. There's the town itself isn't a very updated city. It's uh, all the clothes, everything it does feel just. There's, there's nothing to make you go, oh, there's bits in it where there's roller skating people at a diner they go to. And they're like, why? I can't believe there's still roller skating waitresses, you know. Amazing. But it just has a feel like it could be a very easily, you could do a companion piece and watch those both those films in one day. I actually watched the original on the day before, uh, the day before I went to watch it. And I took the kids with me to watch it. And it was so nice because I was the same age as Elijah when I saw original Ghostbusters in cinema Aww. as he was watching this one. Yeah, and they I, loved it. Oh, and they loved it. And Lodge is seven, Jay's fourteen. They and I watched it. Daisy doesn't really do films, um, but we all loved it, all of us equally. So it's a very well made film. That's just got something for everybody. That's good. I watched Ghostbusters uh, over Halloween for one of my thirty one. So um, I love Ghostbusters too. We've covered it on it's the show. It's a shame. But... I thought it's a shame we never saw this one in the cinema together. You know that they're doing a sequel to Ghostbusters Afterlife, and it's going to follow up on Vega the Carpathian and some extra bits from that as well. How so, they, I don't know how they're putting in part two. Then is it because it doesn't feel like it's in the, the storyline of the. But anyway, I, it, I don't know. I haven't watch, seen it. Watch it, and we'll discuss it in another episode. Can't wait. That's what I, uh, the other things I've been doing very quickly. Um, I don't know why, but I really got into Magnum PI. Yes. Um, I've become gay for Tom Selleck um, ding, 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 literally ding, checking ding, his ding, chest ding, out the other day ding. in the hair and going he's got such a good torso <laughs> it's just yeah. like it's he's got a so huge good. chest covered it's, in hair it's set, um, it, I've been going through season 2 I'm binging at the moment it's, it's, it came out in 82 um, I love it just on the island you've got TC you got all the other people in it and stuff Apollo and Zeus is that the names of the Dobermans uh, I think you are correct yes yeah, and have you had the crossover yet? We the crossover with Murder She Wrote. No, don't. Oh man, that sounds amazing. There's an episode where him and Jessica Fletcher, we talked about her just now, they oh, team up to solve a crime together. That's so cool. And she plays that character, and he plays that Thomas Magnum. It's that's so cool. Amazing, I can't wait. But yeah, I've really got into it. It's such a nice innocence, um, but there's something about it I quite like. Um, anyway, I'll be watching that, and also I took out a subscription of Masterclass. Um, which is uh, classes with many people like Scorsese does a master class on directing um, uh, Samuel Jackson does acting you've got um, DJ from the Roots uh, Drum from the Roots um, does a DJ master class and all these things Tony Hawk does skateboarding and, and there's other things like philosophy all sorts of things and I've been doing loads and loads of classes they're all built into various sections and loads of good tips. Did DJ one, and I DJ for years. I knew most of it, but there's a few things. I was like, "That's really cool. Oh, that's a good idea." So I've just been educating and doing things. And I did a career course. So I've been doing a lot of things, uh, writing a lot of music and stuff, uh, trying to invest in myself a little bit. Um, yes, that's what I've been doing. Lots and lots of. Amazing. Yes. You've been really keeping yourself busy. I'm really busy. It's a bit gone a bit weird, actually. Been writing loads and loads of music, which I'm not going to discuss really now. But yeah, you know what it's like. You've heard something. I do. I've heard some of it. The, uh, the only thing I've watched that I wanted to mention, I already talk, said that I, met, I watched Santa Slay the other week. Um, we'd already covered that. But there was one documentary that I did get. I did watch. Um, it's quite an old one, that. It's 2016, but it's called David Lynch, The Art Life. He does a masterclass, teaches filmmaking. His this documentary, it's it's not about his films. It's this about is, his early is, life. This is new, isn't it? It's 2016. Oh, okay. I think he's involved with something else, which came out recently. Okay, but it, it's just such. It's just like his films. It's just like Twin Peaks. It is quite scary, but it's also really cozy and very sort of surreal. That's how I describe everything he does. And it's just like him sort of talking about 
when I was eight years old, I remember a bee stung me on the earlobe. This made me produce some drawings. And you know how he talks. It's just like, and you're watching it. And this is like interspliced with some of his really dark artwork, his drawings and his paintings. And then you're watching him like make models out of plasticine. And it looks like he's like killing small animals. Alice was like, what the fuck are you watching? I said, it's David Lynch. Like, it's just him making art and telling you about his childhood. It's so fucking weird. And then it gets to the only film it covers is A Razorhead, his first film. It sort of talks about how he got the warehouse and how he lived in the warehouse where they filmed that for years and he, he would go to the set at night as i would sit and sleep on the set on my own it's just so weird such a weird guy but i kind of want to hang out with him every episode every scene where they're, they're interviewing him he's looking off into the distance with a cigarette in one hand yeah. and a glass of glass of red wine in the other or sometimes he's just drinking a coffee it's just like it's just imagine brilliant. spending a day with him just the day where do you want to go now David I would like to go to a wine shop amazing okay we're gonna go there but yeah highly recommend David Lynch The Art Life it's really 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 good by the way Dan if you hear any banging or anything you're like what the hell's that it's the kitchen downstairs they're screaming away and stuff I thought you were going to say it's um, Santa coming down your chimney. <laughs> coming in the chimney. <laughs> so there we go. That That is, that's Christmas in a nutshell. It is, and I hope everybody is having a nice time. And even if you don't give a fuck about Christmas, I hope you're having a nice time anyway. Treat yourself. David Lynch's uh, Agent Cooper would always be like, treat yourself every day. Have a look. Just give yourself a little treat, even if you just buy yourself a little coffee. I just did that, didn't I? Before the show, just drank it now. Uh, oh, coffee. That, that's one other thing. We, we traditionally usually talk about what we're snacks we're having. I've oh, got, I'm going for. I've got Stalin cake. I've got some. You can mute your mic though. Yeah, I've got some mixed nuts. Listen, don't know if that'll pick up. I've got some mixed nuts with raisins in them. I've got some mince pies down here. I've got some chocolate orange or orange chocolate, whichever way around you want to say it. And I've got some Hobgoblin beers, some red wine, and maybe for later, I've got some Bailey's chocolate liqueur. But obviously, I'm not going to drink all of this, because by the end, by the outro, I'll be a dribbling mess, which I am most Christmas specials. I have got two tubs of chocolates uh, yeah, that I was given... lunatic. <laughs> I was given by people. <coughs> Excuse me. What do angry mice send each other at Christmas? What? Cross mouse cards. Brilliant. Let's get going before everybody turns this off. Let's get into a trailer for Wolf of Snow Hollow and we'll come back and we'll discuss this film with you all. We have every reason to believe that this monster will show up again tonight. now for six years sober for three this is scary it's new i never saw a body like that there's gonna be a lot of late nights and overtime because of the brutal murder that happened in town and i didn't want to set up expectations that i can't keep our expectations of you are very low spans of the bites are gigantic same as the distance of the paw prints it's a wolf or maybe it's a werewolf no let me just make this perfectly clear there is no such thing as werewolves our killer is a guy, and I'm going to find him, and I'm going to kill And we're going to bring him to justice. We have every reason to believe that this monster will show up again tonight. I won't ask you to pray with me because of the goddamn lawyers. Where were you? Where were you? John, not of you talk to me at once, okay? They're saying it's a wolf. No, it's a man. When do I get to be right about something? Do your job! Do your job! I am begging you! You want to be 
sheriff. How about we start acting like one? The Wolf of Snow Hollow from 2020. Terror grips a small mountain town as bodies are discovered after every full moon. Losing sleep, raising a teenage daughter and caring for his ailing father, Officer Marshall struggles to remind himself that there's no such thing as werewolves. There we go. We were very excited when this was um, announced. Uh, came out on Prime, I think. Um, I liked it so much that I bought it. So I own a digital copy of this. It's not often I'll do that. Uh, I really, I mean, that kind of gives away what I think of this film. I really like it. But I'd only seen it once. So this was my second ever watch. Um, the director is also the main star and also the writer, Jim Cummings. And I remember, one thing I do remember is that you were sort of on the fence as to whether you enjoyed this film or not. And one of the reasons was, I think, if I remember rightly, Jim Cummings, in your books, wasn't, or in your opinion, his acting wasn't... I don't know, you had an issue with his acting. Am I right? Am I remembering that correctly? This is my second viewing. So, yeah, I don't. I can't remember my exact thoughts then, but obviously I can give you my thoughts now. Please do. Um, um, well, just going very quickly, just get into that and get it out of the way straight away. Um, I don't like his face. I, okay. I, I was watching this and I was like, I don't mind. I don't think he can act drunk. Um, but it's really weird because there's some scenes he's absolutely fine and blends in very well with the rest of the all Because all the acting is very good in it. Everything. He's, he's directed very well. It's edited exceptionally well um it's written well it's it's really good it's, it's got some shot. lovely dry humor it's shot it. very well it's shot as well. very well it's a really well produced film you know production being the umbrella of the, every department it's really well produced film um but yes i don't really like his face for, and, and that's kind of my problem i discovered today i literally at times he's all right but it's just like i don't which is a shame because he's in every scene <laughs> pretty much and it really is a shame because otherwise I think I'd really like the movie more and I don't know what it is I can't you know maybe I, maybe when I was younger someone like that did something to me not like something weird Jesus Christ <laughs> I don't well, know what it is I just don't like his face but and it's funny though the last movie that this dude did Jim Cummins um, he, he was a he's in a movie where he was a, a cop who was having a nervous breakdown that's the last movie he did. And he's kind like, of doing that in this one as well. Yeah, and I thought that's strange. He should have got it more. Well, he, he does get it quite well, actually. I do like the fact he's an alcoholic in it, and uh, he goes to AA, and he's having a meltdown. I don't know what it's like to have a breakdown. He's at he's at this sort of age where we are, Dan, and yes. um, we know what it's like to have all these layers upon you, and you're like, ah, and I completely got that, and I, I was with him for the ride. And that's the scenes where I think he's fine, that big one-shotter later mm. on. Um, yep. But yeah, Jim Cummins. Cummins. Stop spell, saying spell Cummins. The, spell the sexy way. Well, it's funny enough, the score. Spell the sexy way. <laughs> the score, it's not C O M, it's C U M. Yeah. So the score. The score, which is really good, is by Ben Lovett. And now I thought Cummins and Lovett, you could have that as a production company for porn. Yeah. Another Cummins and Lovett production. production. Yeah. Bend over and fill a crevice together for the first time in harmony <laughs> no, sexual I, harmony that's what the I, movie's called sexual harmony i agree with you not about that about this film <laughs> i agree with you <laughs> just have a discussion um, about sexual harmony that i agree this is my second watch and this time around i can't quite believe how polished this film is it's, um yeah I, I love the orion classics logo oh yeah. it's so good to see mm -hmm. that um the the colour palette, Alice was like, the colour palette is incredible in there. She was watching some of it with me. She said, I just, I love the snowy blues and the reds that you get. Um, it feels a bit Twin Peaksy at times, but not in a we're trying to be Twin Peaks way, just because it's a small town with Sheriff. It, or Fargo it's, as it's, well, that kind of thing. I was about to say, it's doing the Fargo Twin Peaks. It's just doing a small town and all the acting is superb. Um, the acting is top 
No, um, it, it's just acting. You don't look at it and go, "Oh, you don't have any opinion really." To oh no, you do. It's good acting, but like, do you know what I mean it passes by very easy? You don't at any point go, "Oh, that was a bit sketchy." Um, One of the best actors in it for me, and we'll come to the story in a minute, was the guy that plays PJ, whose girlfriend, the first girl to die. Um, that jock. Yeah, but he, I thought he just because he was a jock, but he was so. When they go and visit him later on, and he's really, really upset. As you would be, and they're trying to talk he's to him. He's quite camp. But it's just, I just, and then his mum comes over and he's like, mum, tell them to leave. So it's crying. It's like, wow, like, he's really vulnerable, this guy. And I think there's everybody in this is like that. Jim Cummings, everybody in this is it's, like, very vulnerable. It is, it, I tell you, this is the right him, because his character comes across, because he gets really annoyed at, and he's sitting in the bar. He comes across really quite camp at times, at a point where I'm like, is he actually gay? And this is why this movie's writing's a bit more so than the average film. Seems yeah. to be like, characters have got loads of layers going on. They really have. Have. Even he's like a side the, character, just the, but like, the, even, like even just the like, cops. Is he actually gay? He's a bit of a jock, but is he actually secretly gay? And he, his girlfriend has no, because he has this very camp tendencies at times. Like, okay, not not just he could obviously be straight and be camp as well. I'm not going into that sort of field, but do you understand what I'm saying? He comes across a lot more. My gay dial was up. Yeah, fair saying. enough. You know, fair enough. I loved all the cops. The relationship between all the cops is very real. Um, they, they, they seem like they've all worked together for years, which they, you know, they're supposed to have. The two female characters in this are brilliant. Um, it's particularly Detective Julia. She's awesome. Again, she's a very Fargo vibe to the way she does things. Um, and I really, of course, we can't not talk about the late, great Robert Forster. This was his last movie. Hmm. Um, and he looks very old and frail in this, as he, his character is. His character is. He still just looks like problems. him, though, doesn't he? He does. He still looks like he could take a punch on the chin and not flinch. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. There's something about Robert Forster's jaw that just looks unbreakable. Do you know what I mean? Jaw. Yeah. Yeah. What, what did I say? <laughs> you do what we, well, I mean, I always say to you, that's, no, Jaws is called Jaws, Jaws. and you go yeah. Jaws. Yeah, Robert Forster's jaw. 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 Right. I'm from Bristol. I know. That's why I love like winding you up. Oh. Jesus Christ. Anyways, yes, it's a really good it's really well cast the film. Again, very well produced film. Um let's get into the movie. We start off with like this very little town and there's a very big, lovely open mountain shots, very, you know the shining, shining type, but Yay. actually I'd say slightly Sorry, almost slightly better. Um, it just is in the, the like I like those because that's a, obviously a sort of shaky helicopter following along a mountain. Not very. These are very well placed. And obviously drones nowadays it makes it a lot easier, but they just look so gorgeous and it gives it a, brings across exactly what we're getting into with this film. And it's a yeah. very slow movie. It's got a murder mystery element, which when we get to, it, I am annoyed when we find out what is going on with the killer. Obviously, we will spoil it, but we don't have to get there straight away. But when I find out who is killer, it's a bit like, but we haven't been introduced to this person once. Uh, but I kind of like that. I don't. Personally. I think that's really, really, it's another thing that upsets me in this film. It's just at the end, like, oh, that's not a payoff. That isn't, because I'm looking, this whole movie comes across, they're really pushing, like, the murder mystery element with people breaking full fall, looking at the camera with ominous music. Going, Dum. There was that one scene where the killer was in the background briefly, but I think if the, not good it, it would have been very hard, I personally feel, it would have been very hard to tell this story, which isn't about the killer or the killers, it's about everybody else in the town. Yeah, and it's, I think it's, it's if, just if my they to If they'd have tried to thread that, thread the killer popping up here and there or being a character in it a bit, a bit more... I don't know if that would have worked. Well, you, That's why well, I love... Not that much. I'm just saying not that much. I think, like, there's so many little characters come up, pop up in it. But you easy just have I a, suppose a, the a killer could have popped up at some point. But my, 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 my favourite scene... It's that, a small thing. The rest that, of the movie I like. That scene where he's revealed, and we'll get to that later... And that, that is kind of very okay. It but, gets me, man. It gets but me. That's why when it has that old stand up and he's so much bigger. That's what I'm saying. That's the bit had, I mean. Yeah, that's kind of a little bit creepier. If we had had him earlier on, not like that, but going like that the whole time, everyone in town knew him as that spent old person with a bad back, that would have been so much better. Mm. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah but uh, okay. Well, yes, you're right. So we get shining stuff, we get beautiful views beautiful vistas and we focus in on a couple who are arriving for a little holiday off in this lovely little um snowy town they booked a cabin like sexy a little... jacuzzi time oh they're they're gonna basically come and bang for about three days in this snowy cabin you're gonna have to change the water yeah don't get in that jacuzzi after them 
But the cleaner runs in, jumps in, so like, the vents are all going to be a bit clogged, clogged stuff. Ugh. Um, but yeah, so they go out for dinner. Jeez. Man says the F word, as you mentioned, um, the derogatory homophobic term. PJ has a bit of a word with him, winds them up, says, Don't wind up the rednecks, his girlfriend says. Why are you doing that? And he's like, Look, you know, my girl, my brother died, you know, and he's got a girlfriend's like, Look, just we don't know these guys, they could just be anybody. Let's not do it. All right. Okay, that's fine. Back to the cabin. At this point, I looked up and through the crack in my curtains, I could see the moon. I've, picture, sometimes, I? I've sometimes seen your moon through the crack as well. Shh. Um, back at the cabin, they get the jacuzzi on the go. And he, PJ, he's got his ring. He's going to propose. Jacuzzi. In the j- jacuzzi. Oh, I don't know. Jacuzzi. Hot tub, hot blub, um, <laughs> hot tub gum machine. I was going to say, <laughs> hot tub gum machine. Okay, Just now. stop, please. Merry Christmas, everybody. Happy Christmas. Um, so he's going to propose, and he goes outside to see Brianna jump in the jacuzzi with her. But of course, he slips, and he finds her body on the floor completely eviscerated because something, someone or something has attacked her. And we le- are left with a, a nice wolf print on the ground. We, there's no point, uh, there's no reference of scale here though, so it looks like a little nice little cute doggy paw print. Okay. Uh, but they talk about it a bit later I on. Do, I, I do look like what they're going for. Um, it should have been a bit more vicious looking, but this this me being very petty um it, it, i like it it shows the moon so straight away we're getting like what what fuck was this because we're doing through this movie we do have the jaws-esque we're not going to show we're going to just tell slowly um and until later on when we do get some great shots which we'll get to yeah i mean and i will say i think i said this to you before it's some of well the done. shots with the werewolf mm. Um, are some of the best practical-looking hmm. bipedal werewolves uh, I've seen. Just the way it stands up and is revealed from behind cars or things like that. But we'll get again. We'll get into that. But absolutely stunning. They they do it. They do it exactly right. Like you said, it's just like Jaws, Jars. It's, it's just <laughs> through camera angles. It's through very very good editing. Um, Sometimes you're not expecting it. You, you're sort of. There's one scene where he's driving down the road and you just don't expect a werewolf to step out. And you're like, okay, wow, they just went and revealed that right there. Okay, well, that really took me by surprise. I'm going to say, if any any department in here, if I was giving out awards for this movie and department, it's going to be edited, by the way. I think it's fucking amazing. As an editor myself, I, I'm I, really I was the, like, wow, this is really good. Well, we cut to um, Alcoholics Anonymous meeting now where Jim... Uh, or John, as his character's called. I did try to like John here. Straight away, I was like, no, I'm going to be, you know, open-minded. Start listeners. Then as the camera starts panning back and he carries on talking, I'm like, I don't like you. Stop I talking. I honestly don't think you're supposed to like him, though. I think he's a character that you're not supposed to like. That's a bit annoying. It's the first lead thing you see of the lead character. I understand you're not like a character and you can go through their journey and make as they come out the other side or fight their own demons. That, that's the, the purpose of the main character as such. But, like... I don't know. I just really don't like him. Well, he's struggling. He uh, apparently he's broken up with his wife. He's got a daughter who we'll meet a bit later on. Um, he's got he, some shit going on, so I do understand all the layers and stuff which is going got on. A lot and, going on. And, and to be fair, trying to I can act that it would be very hard to act. Do you know what I mean? There's a lot of things going on. You've got to take on as your character in your character's head and portray that. So, you know, I've got, to, I should be quite easy, not easy, I should be easier on. Yeah, because I guess if you want to put it that way, he's playing an alcoholic, depressed who's trying not sheriff. To be, who's a sheriff looking after the town. Who's stress. hunting down yeah. uh, a killer who everyone thinks is a werewolf. Shit ex wife who's just he's seems got an to be ex-wife. shit with him. Uh, that's another more stress. And a 17 year old daughter that hates who wants him. To go, who wants to go out and bang and. I and a dying dad. I understand with a fourteen-year-old te- teenager, just just the problems you just generally have, and that's stressful enough as it is. So yes, I it's a lot to act out. So you know, 
I'll go and slightly and not, only is, not only is his dad kind of dying. Um, yeah, his dad as well. Yeah. His dad is his boss. So that's another fucking... <laughs> There's <laughs> like, another part of me, though, which is like, he directs this film really well. It's written really well, yeah. If he had just directed someone else doing that, it could have been an 8 out of 10 movie. Nicolas Cage. Not Nicolas Cage. But do you know what I'm saying? You could. This movie could have been like, fucking hell, that was a really good movie. Christian Slater. Too old. Wow. Christian Slater's probably too old, really. Wow. Like, oh, sorry. He's too old. Get him out of here. <laughs> I'm not trying to be like some shit producer. Right, anyway. Anyway, so yes. Uh, so he comes out of his AA meeting and he gets a call from the, sh- the main sheriff, who is Robert Forster. And he says come to this crime scene immediately that he arrives and as he arrives they're sort of telling robert forster he's like he doesn't really want to hear this sheriff because you know he's a bit old he's a bit frown he's like i need to hear everything and they say all right okay her vagina has been taken okay <laughs> and he's immediately he's like, i can take it i'm an old man <laughs> <laughs> and he goes oh oh my gosh <laughs> yeah he's immediately like get me out of here and I'm, I'm i need to i'm gonna faint so well, they tell me i can take it tell me was there sexual abuse or rape or anything i can take it tell me the vagina's we missing found oh. Her vagina. oh he says oh. we don't know there was no vagina found yet all right and, and later like, on uh jim john i'm gonna probably just call him jim because jim cummins jim cummins country and western jim. superstar um old jim Jesus. cummins the superstar um he he's sitting at the a uh, bar um, later on chatting about it later later on this is and I uh, love the fact he says uh, maybe he took it to make a flashlight this is like oh I know Jesus Christ God um, and the, the press are hounding them already if you pardon the pun because they sort of pull up and they're like what's going on here then who's who's died and one of the dopey cops shouts out if we find the vagina, do you want us to put it on ice with the rest of it or something like that? And he's like, Jesus Christ. And this isn't the first time because later on it happens and he sort of yeah, beats, he beats his colleague up a little <laughs> bit. But that, we'll get to that. That's quite a funny that scene. It's shot so nice here, this crime scene in the snow, because red on white is always yeah. a great contrast. And it's so simple to do. Everything looks beautiful because it's snowy. Like, you know, it's just one of those things. I do like a movie set in the snow. And. I will watch this film again for these sorts of reasons. It does look really nice and stuff, you know. Um, well, back yeah. at the station, we are as we as the viewers learn that dun, 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 Robert Forster is actually Jim Cummings' dad, and he's got a very frail heart. And he's Daddy like, Cummings. God's sake. Daddy come in. Oh, my God. He's like, Dad, you've got a bad heart. Come on. I need you. When are you going to retire? And he's like, I'm never going to retire. I'm going to do this till I'm dying. He's like, you're going to die soon unless you retire. You know, and they're having this argument. That's giving, that's not helping with his alcoholism that he's trying to keep buried deep alongside his depression and everything else he's got going on. I related to uh, Robert's, uh, his dad's uh, dilemma when he went, oh, my God, there's 11 emails. This is worse than my birthday. <laughs> <laughs> He's brilliant, Robert Forster, in this. I, I relate to the 11, 11 emails. 11 new emails since yesterday? Because it's, it's very funny. It's very good joy humour in this film. <laughs> it really is. It really, really is. And again, it's that kind of Played small town... Well. Yeah, because yeah, played totally good. straight. It's totally straight. That's why it has that uh, Coen Brothers-esque feel to it. So they start interviewing people, and two of the people they interview are the rednecks from the bar, because um, they were some of the last people to speak to the couple. Um, and they sort of say, oh, he tried to pick a fight with us, but it wasn't anything to do with us. You know, They don't say that we use the derogatory term or anything like that. They just said, hey, I called one of my buddies an asshole, and he, he came over and had a go at us. That's kind of left alone, really. And Detective Julia, who I really like, she's probably one of my, probably my favourite character in this. Um, she um, is played by Ricky Lindham, and she starts doing some research online. And she, well, so she's really spaghetti. getting into this case. Now, um, uh, I wonder what they're trying to say here. <laughs> Was she that she's so like because this. This is the thing. With this score, score's very good. I might have to actually find a score. This is one of those things I needed to do. Whenever I find a good score when we're reviewing a film, I need to take a note of it so I can just do it again. Because I know I've said this before, and then I've I've forgotten the films. With this score, it comes across very, very well. They've kind of... I imagine the director, old Cummins, and the the, uh, Cummins and the Love It got together, and they were like, you know, we've got to make this mystery element to it. 
and you get these scenes with these individual characters this is why it comes across almost like a murder mystery these scenes with the individual characters and the music scores very very ominous and t- trying to tell us is this the person who's the werewolf and the fact when we're listening watching her eating spaghetti looking at the crime scene photos and then music starts playing a little bit like that it's a bit like okay straight right i was like right because i i watch a lot of murder mysteries so i have that in my head so i'm like okay oh, do you think this is the wolf that is this the werewolf you know hmm. that's always always with werewolf movies they are very murder mystery yes because all they you could always put those two together they were howling four or five set in the castles very much like that and you could always do that because the murderer is the werewolf like um the werewolf must die and all these sorts of things it's a really good way of doing that very seamlessly putting those two sub genres together and it always comes across like this so it's this point here i'm like what are they saying are they saying she's de- desensitized so much from crime that look at eating spaghetti and watching this crime film uh, uh photos is is fine or is she the killer yeah i get what you're saying because mm. spaghetti is kind of like intestines blah 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 you well, know, just food and, in general you know yeah what did you, I? I was disappointed. And then again, as a cop, she would be desensitised. That would be a thing. So I don't think they're trying to say it's that. But in my head, I was going there. I was just disappointed she didn't put on some leather gloves and cut up some pizza with some scissors. Personally, I, I that's what I wanted. I know. Cobra, Cobra shout out there for anybody. Cobra. Um, <laughs> crime is the disease, crime and I'm the cure. I'm the, I'm the cure. cure. I'm the um, cure. I love this scene now where. The cops get together. It's just in the local cafe to discuss the case. And old, old, old Mr. Cummins here. He comes across. Very, he comes across, doesn't he? Because he's Cummins. <clears throat> he's acting absolutely fine in this scene because they're all on par. All these four cops together, and it's really good back and forth. It's not. They're not trying to push any envelope. They're not trying uh. to do anything outrageous or out there. It's very just kind of Twin Peaks TV. It's just taking its time. We're just Is talking great- about what's going on. There's a great moment where <clears throat> one of their wives happens to be a waitress there and she comes over and says something like, what time are you getting off tonight, honey, or something? And he says, whatever. And he's like, and he waves his wedding, as she walks off, he waves his wedding ring at the, the rest of the cops and says, why did I get married again? And one of the guys was like, we tried to fucking tell you. <laughs> it's just like banter between these guys that have worked together for years. And one of them is sort of like, so do you think it was a wolf then? And Cummings is like, no, it's not a wolf. You know, and he's, his blood, you can see his vein pulsating in his head almost every time someone mentions, was it a werewolf then or a wolf? And he's like, it's fucking not a wolf. Yeah, it, but it's <laughs> almost like he's so fucking goddamn sure because obviously we're not just saying werewolves. He, that's obviously, it, but it could be an animal attack because they think it's something which size for a bear, big bear later on. Yeah. Um, so, but no, he's just really pushing that whole thing. No, it's not. It's almost like he saw something, which for him, he was later on, I thought, oh, did he see something we didn't see? Which proves it was a man. And he is correct. With spoiler alert, when we get there, he is correct, essentially. So, um, it's almost like, did he see something that they didn't see? For straight away, he's like, no, the whole time. It's he's not, got a good instinct. It's not an animal. Think. It's a human, I tell you. Got good instincts. I was attacked by a pig bear once in a bar I in Bristol. You said a pig bear. No, uh, a big bear. Pig bear would be scary. Uh, just a big, big old bear came up to me in a bar and. Uh, really? Yeah. What happened? Got bought a few drinks and I and uh, I, had to t- I had to tell him, look, sorry, mate, I'm married to a woman. How many drinks did you get off him before you said that? Two. Wow. He told me you later were using on. Him. He laughed at me later on, and he said, "What you've done is called pole vaulting." And I said, "What's that?" And he said, "It's where a straight guy takes drinks off of a gay guy yeah. to to vault his pole, like to skip his dick, basically." So he said, "It's called pole vaulting." And I was like, "That is a brilliant expression." So yeah, I was pole vaulting that night. There we go. It's a little anecdote for anybody out there. I love the fact that you wanted a free drink so much that you just went along with it. No, I was, yeah, I was getting, I was enjoying being chatted up. Let's be honest, who doesn't enjoy being chatted up? That's so funny. Did you it know was, straight away? Uh, I was a bit drunk, so initially he was like, "Hey, what are you drinking?" And I sort of said, and he got me a rum. I bet you started rapping to him. Probably. I, but get angry. You're like, he fancies me. I'm going to rap to him because he, he's going to tell me how good <laughs> I am at rapping. <laughs> My name's Daniel from the top of the dome. Bone. Listen to me, this name is Bone. I've heard your rap. You've heard my raps before. So anyway, moving away from um, my bear experiences, snowboarding lessons, that's what's next. Not me, in the film. Snowboarding <laughs> lessons. And there's a moment here where 
Now you're saying that this See? murderer, your murderer, isn't here, but someone stares at the snowboarding teacher so much that it's a makes her very, 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 very uncomfortable. We don't see this person. Well, no, we just see this snow- snowboarding scene. This person all of a sudden, this is, and it's like straight away, like, is she going to be a victim? Why is this person being introduced? It's like a slasher film. You get uh, very small instructions to some very side characters because they're going to be killed, killed off. Um, um, but we see her it's talk about that. Then they cut to the dining room scene with them in, and the camera kind of looks at her, and does she break the... Yeah, she breaks the fourth roll, wall for no reason whatsoever. She just... Uh, the music... All um, music overtakes any dialogue or sound. It's totally muted. It's just score, and she breaks her fall forward, stares at the camera. What's that all about? I like. I like it. I think it's because this person is there staring at her. But breaks just looks at the camera. Yeah, that's fine. I know. It's because we're we're the werewolf. Are they then trying to say? This is what bugs me. They don't introduce the killer earlier on. Are they trying to tell us this is a murderer? This is the wolf. You understand? Yeah. I. This is this is a choice in filmmaking that I am on board with, but you are not. Yeah. I think this is the only difference. Not introducing the killer. Yeah. yeah. This yeah. is the only difference in our our reviews is that I'm on board with that choice, but you're not. But it's good. It's good. It's interesting. It's why we do this because although we're very similar, sometimes we don't agree on things. Agree. It's very rare though. But we do cut to her in the van at night time, and then straight away I'm like, okay, so she couldn't be the killer. She walks back to her van. Here's a howl. Again, wolf still not seen. And she thinks, oh, I'll get up and walk over and see what that noise was. Why the fuck is she doing that? Well, Why? In, in real life, you might. Uh, no, you wouldn't if you hear a howl. Probably. I'd get in that van. She doesn't. Something approaches her, a wolf. and We see a side shot. This is the first time we see the wolf, don't we? Yes, we do. Big, Just big, brief. big kind of dog soldier looking motherfucker. Yeah, it's great. Absolutely brilliant. Um, bipedo, as I said. And while that's all happening, there is a very small scene where we meet John's daughter. Um, I can't remember her name now. Uh, it doesn't really matter. Jenna, that's her name. We meet her briefly as well. So we, we get a little bit of introduction. But then we cut back to the lady and the wolf and all that business. That's the end of that. The next day another crime scene this is the one shot where it just follows Jim or Jim Cummins around the whole crime scene um, and he looks like he's going to have a breakdown but it's really oh, well shot it's done so well he's sort of walking around going why are you doing this this is, do this fucking do that no, pick this bit up no fucking go over there keep the press away from that right okay a wolf a bear no it's not a fucking bear and then he, someone says about a headless corpse so basically the head's been taken on this one he's extremely stressed um, and we cut to the funeral of this woman, and he's at the funeral. He's shown his face because he's the sheriff. And one of her, the dead woman's family members, goes absolutely crazy at him and says, "You should have done more. You should have locked up whoever this lunatic is." Just more stress, really. He's like, "Jesus Christ, I'm just trying to do my job." But he doesn't say that to the guy. But um, one of his deputies thinks it's a wolf and mentions the full moon. And he's just like, shut the fuck up. It's just ridiculous. Ridiculous man. Well, the cops bring in an expert in exotic animals. Um, And this is where he says the line, there is no such thing as werewolves. And that's the kind of line in a film where you know that that probably means that there is going to be a werewolf in this. Ah. Okay. Forensics. Check out the bodies. There's a wolf-like bite. There's animal hair. They find some Rottweiler hair as well. Um, yeah, and yeah, the medical report, yeah. They look at some crime scene photos. I think it's the size of a bear, like I said earlier. So this is two deaths now. So we're looking at, you know, this is getting worrying. So John says to his daughter, like, I know you hate my fucking guts. Because she won't even barely look at him. It's a teenager. He says, all I want to ask you is, have you got that pepper spray that I gave you? Because I, I really don't want you to leave the house. But if you really do leave the house, which I know you will because you're a 17-year-old girl. But if you do leave the house, and please don't. But if you do, take the pepper spray with you. She's like, oh, Dad, get out of my room. And that's kind of, you know. We do teenage. finish, almost finish on the movie with uh, uh, a scene with him with his daughter in the room. But we get to that. Yeah, it's quite a nice scene. I can talk about that as uh, I'm, I can relate yeah, you can. I cannot yet. 
Detective Julia is very nice to John um, as they're driving along. She says, look, don't be stressed. Everyone's just trying to do what they can. Everyone's coming up with their own theories. But we're going to catch this guy. We are going to catch him. Don't worry about it. It wasn't your fault. Yeah, uh, I do like her. You're right. I think she's very well cast. She's such a lovely, just a lovely character and a mm. gr- really good cop. See, this is it. I feel like you almost need an Agent Cooper in the lead. Do you know mm. what I mean? That's what I feel. That's what I want. Fair enough. Not Cummings. Um, Cummings and... <laughs> Cummings and Julia visit PJ, who is Brianna's... They did have a beer bottle thrown at the car as well. They do. Someone throws a beer bottle. We find out who that is later on. It's, it's really it's nicely... It's a fucking mortician, it's isn't it? It's nicely done, because he gets fired <laughs> for it. Because he disses yeah, the so sheriff. Good. Uh, this so good. A, yeah. Well, he's always firing people left, right, and centre, isn't he? He's it's like, weird. He gets a basket. Get the fuck out of you'd here. Think, you'd think him having a nice hamper basket bought by one of the guys would be a nice gesture to chill out. I thought, oh, great, he's going to chill out. No, he gets even worse and fires the guy who gave it to him. And then none of them say anything, and they just let him do it. It's like, that's a bit weird. Um, so, yeah, they go visit PJ, uh, who they're packing up all their stuff. And they're moving, you know, his girlfriend's been killed, his fiance, he was going to propose to her. Um, he's very upset. He says, like, I've told you, I didn't see anything. Um, I've written here, it's a very moving scene. It was actually really moving for me um, when he starts crying. And what makes it more, just more, just casual is he's vaping, which is a modern thing. But he's just kind of vaping and his mum's milling about in the background, putting things away. And they sort of say, you know, look, we're really sorry about this. And he's like, look, just get out, leave me alone. He starts crying. And then just as they leave, he says, Sheriff. When you catch this guy, just keep shooting him until you can see the the ground through the hole in his face. It's such an explicit image he puts in your head. When you find this guy, shoot him till you can see the ground through his face. Wow. Hmm. And he says it like really calmly. And the sheriff almost like, doesn't say anything, but it's almost like, I will. His silence kind of says, all right. Pretty crazy. Yeah. We we cut to a diner with a lady in the diner with her with her headphones and her laptop working away with her child next to her. Uh, her child's been entertained with a packet of sugar. Now there's absolutely no way that this woman's going to get any work done sitting there with their the kids sitting there with just a packet of sugar. It's just not going to happen. Here you go, honey. Have some They're sugar. Be like this is born as shit. What are we doing? And there's no way you could get any work done. So I was, I was just like, don't believe that shit. Another small, very, very small, petty thing coming from me. Well, um, but this she, is an interesting scene, though, isn't it? She feels very uncomfortable because a man... Who we don't see. Uh, off camera, he's very tall. I like this bit. He walks past and he's like... Uh, he's got a voice which is... His voice reminds me of... Um, I don't know who his voice reminds me of. It's an actor that I've seen somewhere. But he, he sort of says... Do you mind if I sit here? There's a science of a lamb's thing going on with this film, especially at the end with the knocking at the door and going into yeah. the house. Um, yeah. And this bit here has got a kind of science of the lamb's feel to it. Just the suspense kind of thrillery type bit going on. Because it's not... it's it's You know that this is the bad person. You don't know what he's going to do. Is he going to take it's the terrifying. kid? Is he going to try and take the kid? Is, but he's in the public... And he's just starting to ask, oh, say to her, just, oh, oh, oh yeah, are you new here? Oh, okay, now I live around here. Very simple questions. And start going into, yeah, yeah, um, I've seen a blue coloured car and blah, blah, blah. And just starts going into a lot more details. And she starts freaking out a little bit. Well, it's very creepy and then becomes quite scary because he says, mind if I sit here? No, no problem. Thank you. Are you guys new around here? I don't think I've seen you before. She's like, oh, we just we moved here like three weeks ago. Oh, I see. Is this your daughter? How old is she? And she's like, why do you want to know my daughter's age? So she says like she's seven or whatever. It's basically just like prepping for being a victim. Then he says, you've got that blue car outside. Right, right in the open. Yeah. At which point she goes over to the counter and says, can I call the police, please? But he's gone at this point. At this point here, though, they didn't. It was very badly done. You didn't see the kid again walk up to the counter with her. Then she looks around and she's like, "Oh, oh!" And you're like, "Is has he taken the kid?" Then you don't see the kid again. The kid's not mentioned again, or the kid. You don't see the kid in the interview room either. Obviously, the kid would not be in the interview room. But do you know what I mean? I, I was a bit confused there. That was mm. like, again, very, very, very fucking small. Well, they interview the police interview her and take a statement. Yeah. And she sort of tells this all over again. Meanwhile, John walks in on his dad. 
Robert Forster's getting a medical examination. And he's pissed off, isn't he? And he says, what's going on here? And he's like, nothing, I'm absolutely fine. And the doctor's like, no, he's not. He's literally could have a heart attack any minute. Yeah. <laughs> and he's like, thanks a lot. Thanks a lot for that, telling everybody this. And he's like, for Christ's sake, Dad, why are you putting me through this? Please, yeah, retire. <laughs> yeah, yeah. He just won't retire. It's funny. He just, but it's because all these killings are going on. It's probably like the most action that's been going on forever in this place. Um, loads of people start coming forward. We have like a, this movie is full of. This is why I like the editor as well. Full of montages, and we have a montage here of people coming forward, um, saying like, oh, "I've seen this, I've seen that, I've seen this and that." And it's a good sense of mystery going on with it. Yeah, yeah. There's people that reckon they've seen the killer. There's one guy that says he smelt like death. It's kind of like the, these people that are giving statements. It's, it's interesting. Um, the lady, Liz, and her daughter. From the diner, who we spoke From the of. diner, who, who gave the statement. It's a full moon. Ooh. And. Uh, <laughs> you're right there, And they get in their car. And they start driving down the road. And we know it's the end for them, really. We know. Yeah. They're, they're old chestnut, the sink in the road. I'm going to have oh, to stop. Have a that? look. Oh, I'm going to have to get out. Oh. What's going on? Oh, look back. What's that? Oh, there's a massive werewolf higher well, they, than my car. They get out and there's a dead deer blocking the the road. And she sort of thinks, well, she what can I do here? She get her gun and go out and leave her kid in the car. She turns around and, like you say, this really tall, probably seven or eight foot tall werewolf stands up from behind her car. It is quite the reveal. It's awesome. It looks great. Um, and... We find out that that werewolf didn't just kill Liz, but it killed the child as well. Yeah, because someone goes, we're straight cut to the morgue, and someone looks under the blanket, and, and their reaction is assuming that the child got killed. Yeah. Um, yeah. There's a very stressful scene, this, because John ends up fighting with the cur- the coroner. Before you could say Kurt Russell there. Don't know why. Not Kurt Russell. How if he was in this, that would be brilliant. Kurt Russell's mortician. There's some really funny dialogue in this uh, this scene, and he secretly starts drinking again. Yeah, goes for the mouthwash all sorts. He's got some secret lagers stashed in the back of his uh, kitchen cupboard, but yeah, he even drinks the mouthwash. I didn't know if that was the to like get away, get the taste away, the smell away, but She's I think he might have been drinking it. She's just be a stoner. Still, still be a sheriff, you know. There's a brilliant moment, probably quite a realistic moment, where he's so drunk that he kind of slips asleep, stood up in the kitchen and lands on the oven, on the oven door. Oven. Yeah, which breaks. Smashes to pieces and he's just a mess on the floor. Now we get the red herring. You, feel, you feel very, very quickly, you feel very bad later on when his daughter finds him and he's drunk as she slaps him because obviously she's probably grown up with that thing. And it made me think, like, God, alcohol can be so bad at times. I know, I'm not saying this because I don't drink and I'm being some sort of fucking preacher, but Christ, alcohol is, uh, is the root of such bad shit at times. Alcohol can tear a family apart, Gav. It, it's, Believe me. I know. It's just ridiculous. It's just, I don't know. It's a very crazy if thing. You, if you don't, um, I just look at it real use differently it correctly. nowadays. Yeah, because yeah, yeah, yeah. alcohol is a drug, and you have to use drugs in a particular yeah. way. Not, we're not give, here to give you guys, you listeners, preach at you. You can do what you like, um, you know. But as you all know, you can do something too much, and drinking is one of those things that people can do too much. And I, people, I know from people experience, people die every day from booze. Yeah, and it's just crazy. Indeed. Anyway, sorry. Uh, that's why parts of this film affected me so much the second time around, and there's another part a bit later on which we'll come back to. Um, red herring time. We see a man see with again. a wolf tattoo. Yeah. And he burning sets a body something. on fire. He's burning something, isn't he? It's a body. It's oh. a burning body. Um, a human and, body? Yeah, a human body, yeah. I didn't somehow... I missed that somehow. I knew he was burning something, but I was... John yeah. starts researching werewolves. He, yeah, he's oh, for fuck's sake. There's a brilliant bit in the library where he falls asleep and he's got all these books on the occult. Again, really brilliant montage. And then when he, he's woken up by the guy. He goes, what the fuck, Jesus No, no he doesn't. His, his, his reaction when he does that is, fuck you! And the, and he the says, goes, sorry, oh. sorry, I just wanted to, to let you know we're closing soon. He's like, here's a good idea. Why not let the cop who's asleep with loads of books on supernatural shit, why not wake him up? That's a surefire way to get fucking shot, isn't it? The, the, the poor old librarian's just like, 
Right. But he says to him, like, if this is, it's, it's not a good thing to do that, is it? I've got a gun here. What if I shot it? Then it'd be lights out, Ray, wouldn't it? <laughs> he's nuts, isn't he? Yeah. He's literally threatening to kill. He's already threatened to kill the coroner. Now he's the threatened librarian. to kill the librarian. The old librarian. And this is the sheriff of the town. That's fucking crazy. <laughs> now, they, they do some more detective work here, and they go to the employer of the dead girl, Liz, who just was killed in the car with her well, daughter. We, well, before that, we do have a quick cut to the news report, and a news report, just to give us a briefing, kind of like Scream, tells mm. us there's a curfew. And we get a lot of shots of the town empty all evening lights on with snow it looks lovely good old curfew mm. it looks it looks really nice though. i love those shots very nice so they they head to the employer of the girl that's just most recently to be called the mother <laughs> that's when they get all the guns and stuff and they they grab oh hang on they grab the answer machine from her desk oh don't they? That, sorry yes and he listens and he hears the killer phone to him and says hi liz you don't remember me probably but we talked briefly in the diner and so he he says, like, is there a copy of this? She's like, well, I'm not sure. So he just rips the phone out of the wall and says, I'll just take this, okay? Well, it's the answer machine, okay. he just pulls it off. And yeah. she's like, well, hang on, I don't know if you can tell. He's like, well, maybe if you don't take this, I'll shoot you for fucking obstructing justice. How about that? No, and he says, and it'll be your fault this, uh, of, of what goes on. And she yeah. walks off and she's like, she says to the deputy, your like, fault. How's, how's it going to be my fault? Like, really, Some like, hits. almost a bit concerned, like, she's going to get in trouble. So, yeah, God, he's very my unhinged. God, he's so... Oh, dude, you need to chill out. So they, they've they traced this guy with the wolf tattoo uh, who's shooting up in a, a little mini, almost like the silver bullet, not silver bullet, almost like the silver camper van in... Um, uh, 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 the wolf moon, bad moon. Bad moon. Bad moon. Um, yeah, and he's shooting up and he's got dogs. And we're, we're thinking, well, this has got to be the wolf. So they get tooled up. We did that one with Jamie, didn't we? We did. Hmm. On Jamie's show, in fact. Jamie and Brian. Shout out to Jamie. Hi. Um, hi, Jamie. Hi, Brian. Hi. <laughs> uh, Robert Forster can't go on this mission while they're all getting tooled up because he falls over and his heart's given out on he him. He gives and... a motivation speech and he's he's been held up sneakily his little hand under his arm from uh, old, uh, old young Cummins. Uh, he's given, oh, holding God. up old Cummins. <laughs> And um and ah. um uh, and as soon as he says motivation speech, he'll walk out. He has to drop down. He's like, "Look, no more. You're fucking retired. That's it. End of." He says to him, "Dad, he, the look on his face. This Jim Cummings acting is incredible. He looks at his dad and he says, I 'I can't do this anymore. I can't do my job with knowing that you're like this. Please, you're retired, okay?'" And he's like, "All right, go get him." He, funny enough, though, he actually old old John. He actually looks. Like a bit like a wolf. Okay. Do you not think? Because at one point I was like, "Is he the werewolf?" Um, yeah. He just says to him, "I can't take this anymore. Please, will you retire?" And I was like, and he goes out to the desk, and he he does some good acting. Yeah, he says to the woman behind the desk, "Please look, please." Look. She sees I've 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 been in these situations before when there's something going on and it's so much on that, and you you just need the, the up another human being to give a. a um, just a bit of comfort to you and a complete understanding and you can both have a, a certain moment you all of a sudden are just like I need help please help me as a fellow human being and they help you and it's like thank god for that thank you cause I've been in desperate situation I've, I've been in situations you know and I really felt for this I really understood it and it's so nice where she's like look I've got it I've got it it's fine it's okay he, he basically is she trying to say to her he's trying to say to her my dad needs an ambulance right now his heart's given out at the same time I have a job to do right now. I'm in charge of a mission. A load of tooled up cops were going out to bring in this killer, and I cannot take the time to stop it. And but you can't get the, any of those words out. So, like you said, she reads his mind. She's like, "Just go, and I'll deal with your dad. It's fine." Mm. Like you say, she just that takes that for him. Um, meanwhile, his daughter Jenna, she's sending uh, pictures of herself to her boyfriend, and uh, she rings him up. Breaks four four. Looks at the camera again. She does, and she and says, like, "Is she the werewolf?" She says, "Do you wanna, do you wanna meet me tonight then, or what?" And her boyfriend's like, "Well, hell yeah!" So, um, what is she? How old is she? I think she's basically seventeen, okay. eighteen, maybe. And they meet up in the car, and she doesn't waste any time. She's straight on his lap. She knows what she wants, this young lady, and they start steaming up the windows straight she is away. Not hopping his uh, javelin. What was it? Pogo stick? What was it? Uh, not pogo stick or javelin. It's pole vaulting. <coughs> 
she was not voting his poll. Yes, she was straight on the poll. <laughs> Excuse me. Um, there's a great moment while they're in the in the car and they're getting steamy, and then a, a lady in the house next to the car where they're parked starts waving at them frantically, and he's like, "Oh shit, that woman's seen us!" And then they realise she's not waving at them; she's waving to say, she's "Look out." In. There's something behind you. I feel like we've seen this before in a film, but I'm not sure. Um, but Pant- yeah, Pant- that's, that's because a werewolf just runs at the car and tackles it so hard. It it sort of it doesn't flip over, but it rocks quite a lot, doesn't it? Mm. And they're like shit, and then it runs around the other side, smashes the window. Um, Jenna manages to get out. Um, it's a really good scene, actually, and it reminded me of, I don't know why, the scene in Jurassic Park where they're stuck in the Jeep and the T-Rex is sort of shaking the car trying to get them out. That was pretty good. I what? don't know I don't know why, I just got that feeling from while, it. While this is happening, just before this, you've got John, Jim, uh, sitting in his, his cop car, just sitting there with his eyes shut, waiting, and you get this really nice moment where he, get, he comes on the radio and he's like, vroom, looks into the camera real close, and vroom, go, vroom, and Yeah, because he goes, grabs the radio and he goes... He looks like he's asleep, and he hears no, he coming down. And he goes, he's "This is Jim. I'm good to go." Yeah, and he just f- slams his foot down. Um, yeah. And he gets there. He gets to there, and he gets out, and he starts shooting at the the whatever it is, the wolf. We assume it's a wolf. He doesn't question it. He sees it's a werewolf. He shoots and from he the just car starts blasting as he gets it. out. It's like probably kind of really realistic, more like he starts shooting from the car. Like, but on Millie, he sort of scares him. He's going to run away, right? So he's just like, "Fuck it, I'll get shoot." Start shooting this. But then he sees his daughter there, and she's her uh, head banged on the ground, and he gets and she's got no trousers on. She's got she's no trousers on, underwear. and he gets really ang- angry of her, and she she gets super angry of him. And I'm on Jim's side here, and it's like, no, fuck you. I I know you've hurt your fucking head, but like, just see the situations going on here. Like, I've got so many layers of stress. I I was completely with him on this. I was like, yeah, I agree with you. I I was just like, no, he is in the right here. Fuck her. Uh, Yeah, your head's probably hurt. Yeah, cool. Let's have a quick look at it. No, you'll live. Right? There's a lot more things at stake here. Stop being a selfish little fucking cow. Yeah, because he (laughs) says, she says to him, aren't you going to ask how I am? And he says, no, you can tell him a dad, can't you? He says, no, I'm not going to ask you how you fucking are because I told you to fucking stay in tonight and you've come out here fucking your boyfriend in the car and here you are in your underwear and I'm chasing down whatever this is. I haven't got time to worry about you. If you'd have stayed in, how can I do my job when I'm worrying about you? Get yourself to hospital if you've got a head injury. And she's just trying to pull the fucking card on him. Or you, We don't know the history and he probably was a really shit father back in the day or something. But still, come on. Well... They, he, she, but she still needs her dad because she puts her trousers on and then she gets in the car and go. And the police car and says, "Take me to hospital." Take me to hospital. <laughs> and oh, he's like, Argh! exactly. And he can hear in the background a shooting going on. And then you find out one of his other cops, an officer yeah. Chav- Chavez, is squashed up and put in a bin. He's been killed and put in the bin. <clears throat> so, sorry for my throat. It's all right. Um, brilliant and very random scene there where it's the middle of the night really good music score that been seen and the, the the woman cop that you like just falls against the fence totally in shock and the camera pulls into it. really well made oh I, i'm sorry uh, i was jumping ahead a little bit to the the random scene where jim decides to kidnap his daughter's <laughs> boyfriend and really with a shittest mask ever he's hammered he's got a terrible mask on he breaks into the house Grabs her, grabs him in bed. He basically, he's gonna duff him up a bit and say like, "Leave my daughter alone." But, but the kid's he's too drunk. Comes in. She pepper sprays him. Both of and them and her kid. And he just pours loads of milk over his face and walks out. And she's like, "What have you done?" Yeah, why but is the best he, thing is, is when she, well, when she realizes the sheriff is broken in drunk, she isn't worried. She's more worried about what her son's done to provoke yeah. this response. Yeah, why have you got the drunken sheriff coming in with a mask on and I've pepper sprayed the sheriff and now he's in the fucking drink he's pouring milk all our milk over the place. I must remember this though, if I ever get pepper sprayed, pour milk in my face because that seems to do the trick. Well, that's what when you eat a very hot curry or anything chilly, milk is the thing. So this, this is... The, Amateur, the, Dan. Amateur. This is a bad night for him because... Why do I know? I shouldn't be saying feel so proud of my proneness that uh, uh, I know if you get pepper sprayed milk. Why should I know that? (laughs) Why would I be in a situation where someone's going to pepper spray me? I should know this. I'm not some sort of person that wanks outside windows like Ted Bundy. Okay, only my window on Christmas Day. (laughs) 
<laughs> oh, it's snowing, Alex. Oh, he's wearing his He-Man pants again. It's snowing. I can see it falling against the window. <laughs> it's black. Just a few spots, but... Um, it's way too much ejaculation in this episode so far. Bad, bad night for Jim, though, because... He shot at the werewolf. He's found his his daughter in her pants in the street. They've had a big argument. Then he got so drunk he's tried to kidnap her boyfriend. It's a shit he, get, he gets to the hospital to visit his daughter, and his dad's dead. Yeah. Just to make it really shit. Cut to the dude who's burning. I know his dad died. It's not really. It's a bit shit. I'm I'm straight away like. Oh, anyways. But anyways, <laughs> cut to the dude who's burning stuff earlier who had the wolf tattoo and he, he's injecting himself. So I was straight around, I'm like, is he like, is it like uh, Mark Well from Paris? And he's injecting himself to turn into a wolf, you know? Or is he trying to like keep it at bay by... Yeah. Yeah. Um, it's, he gets hammered now, doesn't he? He starts drinking as he pulls out one of his own teeth. He's... An absolute mess. This is this is Jim, not the guy with the tattoo, because we do cut to him and find out that this dude actually was uh, jacking up and uh, is OD'd. Yeah, and he's dead. So they think they've got him. This they've is got like him. this is like we got him. It's a tiger shark. A what? A what? <laughs> this is the tiger shark moment now. Where they think they've got, they've got the shark, but they haven't got the werewolf. Um, we, we, there's, uh, there's going to be a, a Jaws reference in Die Hard 2 actually but we'll get to that oh great I look forward to that a what a what <laughs> um, yeah he gets really hammered and obviously his dad's dead he, Jenna finds her dad really really drunk she actually feels really sorry for him she cries and says please get your shit together because I'm your daughter I, I can't be looking after you and they kind of reconnect a little bit he does this incredible scene this is the scene I talked about earlier that really moved me where he talks about grief and depression a couple of things I've had to deal with myself in the last 18 20 months and he says to her I'm a shit dad I'm an asshole father and now I'm a fucking orphan and there's something about him saying I'm an orphan even though he's a, a middle aged man he's lost both his parents now and he's he's dealing with all of this horrible stuff and as well as his dad dying and it's just the way he says and now I'm an orphan and it, that makes his daughter really break down crying even more and this scene was just emotions to the point that Alice looked at me and I was crying on this scene she looked at me and she went you were right. I went I don't know why this scene's really affected me. She was like... Yeah, but you, it was relatable, wasn't it? Yeah, 100%. Yeah. yeah it was just, just, again, just a credit to the acting in this film. It really moved me, this scene. It's an incredible scene. Um, yeah, we found the guy, they say. We found the guy. Great. No one seems to... Some people aren't really convinced, particularly Jim. But, I don't know. It's all good. Uh, he was six foot five. So he must be, he fits the description. Huge guy, he's got a wolf tattoo on him. A lot, lot him. of tall people in that place, must be in the water. Yeah, it must be. Very tall people with wolf tattoo, especially this one. Um, body's in the morgue, he goes back to AA, and he admits that he's had a nervous breakdown. There's a, have we missed the scene where he had a go at the guys in AA? We took, we've skipped over that, where he goes there drunk. And they say, Jim, we can't let you into this meeting. And he's like, fuck you, and fuck your wife. And he says, I see what your wife posts about me on Facebook. And what you can tell your wife to do is print that shit out, roll it up and take a big sit on it. Because, ah, oh, fuck your wife. Your wife's a whore. And he's having to go at everybody in the AA meeting. So he goes back there with his tail between his legs and says, hi, my name's Jim and I'm an alcoholic. And they're like, welcome back, Jim. And he's like, um, I had a relapse and I'm drinking again. <laughs> it's, it's really good, though. <clears throat> it's another really good montage scene here, which cut really well with him cut into him doing this with between him going to people's houses giving back evidence yeah he's giving back the evidence to everybody um and it's something in his brain while he's going cold turkey and trying to quit drinking something in his brain is connecting dots while he's delivering this evidence back um he gives it back someone spits in his face one of the women you know he's, he's not made many friends he's made a lot of enemies um in this time and when he gets to see whoa, peach whoa. He's giving back the little girl's stuff. <clears throat> yeah. Uh, and he says, like, here you go, just sign this. Well, you could say it with a bit more emotion. I know, I know. Yeah, he's not really with it, is he? He um, he, he goes to see uh, PJ. Well, actually, Julia goes to see PJ. And she's like, oh, um, 
Oh, no, sorry, he rings her up and says, oh, you left something at mine. She's like, no, I don't think we did. And he's like, yeah, you, you left like a needle, like a sewing needle. It must have got mixed in with all the evidence. She gave back to me. It's nothing to do with mine. Do you want it? She's like, I don't know what you're talking about. Yeah, I, I'm confused here. Help me out. Well, that sewing needle was to do with Paul, because that must have been on the crime. He must have left it on the crime scene. Paul the taxidermy guy, who, oh, sorry, that's the killer. Um... So he must have left one of his big needles that he does taxidermy with and sews animal skins with. But we didn't, other we didn't see scene. him with this though, or anything, did we? Where, 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 the where, when where he was did the werewolf, we see him? When he was the werewolf, when he attacked Brianna in the very opening Why scene... Why did he have a sewing needle with him? Was he using it would that? have been just in his suit. Oh, that was a clumsy it, mistake, wasn't it? It was. So Julia's thinking... See, Detective this, is, this, is, thinking, this hmm. is my problem with this. You're doing this now, and then Jim goes in there and looks up, and he, he sees some... Um, not crochet, he sees some... Uh, what those things made? Uh, tapest- not tapestries? Like, yeah, type. tapestries. And he sees some that where it's been sewn, and he's like, ooh. But we don't have a bit of this earlier on in the movie to give us a little bit of this. But what it's I like so about it is... Yeah, but that, that's what I like about this. Is this it's is not, such? It's no, no, you can't have no, no, just no, 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 I found this something. Is, something. This is your great. opinion, though. My opinion is, I like this sudden realization because I have the same surprise slash realization horror hit me at the same time as Jim. So to me, the story allowed me to take part in the story, if that makes sense, because I suddenly realized everything he was realizing as he realized it. I was like hang on a minute something about this setting is creepy so let, let's go to the scene he goes to see this taxidermy guy and he says to him oh, i've just got to give you this stuff back you know and he's all very down and out and he's like would you like a coffee yeah okay and then he says a very creepy thing he says you mind if i spill something in your coffee meaning you know can i put a bit of whiskey or something in there pulls up and jim's obviously like yeah i'd like that very much actually and then he realises I shouldn't be drinking, I shouldn't be sort of chatting to you about this stuff. I've got to get going, I've got to get going. But his brain, like you said, he's looked around the house, he's seen the sewing and all the stuff, and he, there's something about this guy. What, what evidence did they have which was his? Uh, I think they just interviewed everybody in the town, or pretty much everybody in the town. Right. I, st- I still wish they'd just shown us a scene earlier, even if we didn't ask him, and he was there saying something about the, the tax term. I really, it's, I, I can't it's get quite- over it. Well, it's quite a short film. It's only 80 minutes, so they potentially could have cut some... They might have cut some yeah, scenes out. That's a prime scene, though. Yeah. But um, he leaves the house, and then something in his brain... Yeah, he stands outside, and he's just standing there with his coffee going, hmm, and turns and thinks, around and goes back to the house. He thinks, I, can't, I cannot leave. Well, we, he opens the door, this fella, and he's quite crouched down like he's got a humpback. Or, and then or, we or see him in the very... kitchen, he's already sitting down. Yeah. Uh, and he says to him, where is your wife away? And he's like, what makes you say that? He's like, oh, I've just seen that you've got loads of booze behind you there. Just some weird stuff. It doesn't add up. So Jim goes back to the door, knocks on the door, and he says, did you forget something, Sheriff? And he says, uh, and he closes his eyes. And he doesn't open his eyes at all, Jim. And he just keeps his eyes shut. And he says, look, I wouldn't be doing my job if I didn't say, can you please stand up to your full height? Do, do you ever have this with people? I had this recently. There was a, uh, this guy I had to, uh, for whatever reason, I had to chat to this person back and forwards for the next couple of hours. I can't remember what the reason was. And it was a person that would shut their eyes when talking to me. Yeah, I've met people like that. What are you, what are you doing? Why are your eyes shut? Why is it so deep concentration that you have yeah. to... Like, why just talk to me? Why have your eyes shut? It was the weirdest fucking thing. One of my kickboxing instructors, actually... Or is it, oh, am I so grotesque? You don't want to look at me? That's no, I fine. just think it's, it's either a nervous <laughs> thing or it's just a habit. One of my kickboxing instructors would quite often shut his eyes when he said stuff. Like, he'd come up to me and go, yeah, down. he's possibly more in deep in thought of something. Or... Essentially. But this was not. So, I, I also know a couple of people weird. that look look away. From, they look over my shoulder, so they're talking, but they can't they make. They just eye, can't do eye contact. So they look. Yeah. So it's just a nervous yeah, thing. Fair enough. Anyway, so he does know, this. So he says, "Please stand to your full height," which this guy does, and he. This is great. This scene because his head goes from being like five foot up to about seven foot, and because he's only just peeping around the door, and you're thinking immediately, "Ho." Lee. And this is what Jim thinks. So he's he's like the door gets slammed and he breaks it in. He's like, radio's back. Can't get through in the radio because white noise static. So he breaks through the window. 
And this uh, is very, this is very uh, uh, thingy, sorts of lambs, isn't it? Very clever. It is, yeah. And he gets stabbed, um, you know. Really and fucking stabbed and pushed up like Michael Myers, the, the dude who goes to get the beer for PJ Souls in Halloween. Yeah. Real Cause like it, that. Because this guy's so tall, he puts him up about five foot in the air into the wall. It's pretty na- nasty. And um, he manages to come down off that and he gives chase and he catches him putting on a wolf costume and it turns out that he's not a werewolf so it's, this is not a supernatural film mm. or movie sorry to spoil this but we did say spoilers it's a psycho killer who is into taxidermy it's a serial killer yeah like but like it's really well Buffalo done Bill. and also he's like a furry you know what furries are no no, for, so furries are people that dress up as animals. Oh, like yeah, no, se- Sexual Jay pleasure, used... that kind of thing. Oh, I was about to say, Jay used to do that, but not no. sexual pleasure, really. It's, it's, just... usually, it's usually sexual uh, stuff going on there. Oh, right. Um, like, like in The Shining, funny enough. There's a moment in The Shining where we see a little bit of that. Um, Bear blowjob. Yeah, exactly. I, again, takes me back to the night in my butt. Uh, <clears throat> um, so he gives chase to this guy and the guy clearly is deranged enough to think he is a werewolf because before he's even put the werewolf mask on he kind of howls at Jim doesn't he yeah he, uh, he runs ah! off chase, and then chase through the woods chase him through the woods um, but he gets shot by the by the lady cop yeah and we hear um, old, should Julia. old acquaintance be forgot yeah the old... yeah. And uh, uh, but well Jim shoots the wolf in the head lots like he said he would like he said he would, yeah, he goes out, he blasts his face off um, several times, and then he collapses. And it ends like a 90s crime film. Silence of the Lamb 7 it kind of ends, you know, we don't know if our hero's dead or alive, but the, the baddie's dead, that's the main thing. And we, we see Jenna's at college, and Julia sort of goes there and says, oh, you know, good luck with everything, we're really proud of you. You know, we're so pleased to see that you're moving on with your life and getting on. And then right at the end, John steps in the room. He's still alive. You know, he's recovering from his injuries. And he says, I love you. And she kind of looks away, doesn't really answer him. But we know she loves him. They've rekindled their relationship. So they've got a long road ahead of them, but they're going to get there. Um, and he wants to leave her some protection. He makes a bit of a joke. <laughs> he says, there's some protection in your door. She's like, Jesus Christ, Dad, get out. But then um, she smirks because she's like, I'm getting all over that dick. And so goes to the goes to look in the drawer and pulls out the condoms. Yeah. Then looks in and then there's something else. Did he leave her a gun? Yes, I, I think he left her a gun. That's because a bit full on, isn't it? The reason I know he left her a gun is because my favourite moment, one you know, of my favourite moments you know that, is... This... You, know that, you know the roommate is going to just get drunk, come in with the friend saying, there's a fucking gun. Let's go look for a dildo. Oh, it's a gun. Either, well, he could have left her pepper spray. <clears throat> but I know he left her something. There's to... a gun to defend herself with because her reaction very no no the very final scene is hilarious and if you're not listening carefully you'll miss it but as jim walks out of the college because his daughter's a gymnast she's on the gymnast team and as his daughter as he walks out the college these two little chubby kids walk past and goes what i heard the girls gymnast team is in the same dorm as me Uh, yeah they're literally down the corridor imagine those guys and uh you listening yeah, <laughs> and he so he says. Im- imagine um, he basically says, "I'm going to try and boink all the gymnast team." And Jim stops for a second, and sort of you think, "Oh, is he going to do something?" And then he stop and he carries on walking because he knows his daughter's going to handle herself against these two little punks. So yeah. that's how I know there's yeah. something in a drawer, I, other than Magnum condoms. I think oh, I thought it was a gun. I think it is from a reaction. <clears throat> I think it's a gun, but I think it's a bit bad if it is a gun because we don't see it. If it's a gun, it's poorly, it's poor humour in light of everything that happens in America all the time with the college campus shootings and everything. But it's like Marcellus Wallace's briefcase. We won't ever know. We'll never know what's in there. Just like we'll never know how long the gimp's been in his box. How long? All weekend? Just that three morning? days. Three days on, four days off. I think. I think he does. Does he does he soon get out do some yoga to stretch because that's gonna hurt circulation is gonna be all over the place I'd be I'd fucking be bad for me my feet would uh, probably dropped off I think parts of him get stretched regularly mm. Mm. anyway we've gone back to gimps listen this was the thumbs up from Snow Hollow oh my god this film so I'll wrap up very quickly I'll just say I've 
don't know if I've ever seen a film quite like this. And that's high praise. But let me explain why I say that. It's because everything is very polished in it. And I know you've got a problem with some of the acting, but I think for me, all round, the acting is very, very good. The production, the sound, uh, the look, um, just everything about it. Even the story is very original. I like the fact that we think we're watching a werewolf film and it isn't, which grinds it in reality even more. I love all the characters in it. And I love, love, love Jim Cummings' performance as a man trying his best to hold everything together and it's all falling apart or all, all whilst trying to solve what is potentially a supernatural crime i just think this is an incredible film um it gets 8.5 out of 10 from me it's Fucking quite high hell. quite high and i bought it digitally and i, I will probably watch this most every sort of wintery time because it's a really good winter film it's actually set at christmas so you could also watch it at christmas i love it Love it, but yeah, thumbs up ultimately. So we don't really do numbers 8. on this show. Five, I'll give it a six point five. Uh, yeah, that's still good though. I, yeah, yeah. Well, I, I think it's a very well made film, uh, and I will come back to it. I just wish it was a different lead actor. I think it's a grower. I think. Uh, yeah, I don't think I'm going to grow to that. I think any time you watch it, you will pick up a few more bits here and there. I just don't like his Chevy Chase. Fair enough. Let's get on with it. So that was. The Wolf of Snow Hollow. It's on Amazon Prime. I think you can only buy it weirdly at the moment, but you can probably rent it somewhere else. I loved it. Gav thought it was all right. Just doesn't like the lead actor's face because he loves him too much. Oh, Gav, before we um, get in the time machine, just wanted to say to you. Almost forgot about the time machine. We almost came to the end of that. Do you know what they sing at uh, Snowman's birthday party? No. Freeze a jolly good fellow. Freeze, Freeze a, a jolly, jolly good, good fellow. fellow. There we go. Very good. Right, well, let me get this time machine started up. Okay. And we're going to be going back to 2016. I'm going to wear knee pads today. I Nof- would. With nothing else. Machine. Oh. Oh, no clothes. I mean, no other pads. Oh, I thought you meant just pads and nothing else. Yeah. Okay, well, it's Christmas, so you've got to put this bit of tinsel on. Let me just tie it around here. Ooh. <laughs> here we go you didn't expect me to tie it around that bit did you no I'm just gonna back away in the hedge like Homer I thought you said a hedge like coma no it's a Simpsons reference but it's going I, to be I know, over, right over that, your I've head I've seen that gif okay no, cool I've seen the gif um, it's the one with that yellow guy sort of coming out of a big the big white green, shirted green fanny trousered, y- 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 kind of yeah, yeah. Uh, right well Let's get this time machine started up. Let me crank it up. <laughs> you ready for this? Candy canes. And we're off. Whoa. What's this machine? This is my time machine. Your huh? time machine? Yeah. For the next five minutes, we are going to be the time team. The time team. Whoa. Whoa. What's this? Look at that. Look at that. Oh, he's been dead a hundred years. Look at that. Look at that. That's a Statue of Liberty coming out of the sand. Oh, there's a dinosaur. Oh, my God. Look at that. It's something else. Oh. We're here. Fresh. I did a lot better. We're in 2016. It's not too it's too far away, was it? It wasn't That's that long saying. ago. We haven't got that much more we can do of these. What a year 2016 was, Gav. Well, I don't know. Tell me. Remind me. Uh, it's, 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 we're living in a world now, especially since COVID and all that. It's just, even though COVID was made us everybody stay inside and that, which slowed things down, We ha- a lot of other things have sped up, like news and things going on in the world. Every five seconds there's some crazy thing. It has kind of died down a little bit, but there's been so much going on, I yeah. can't fucking remember it all. Well, 2016, um, only five years ago, uh, as we record this. Preternatural it- came out. You what, sorry? Preternatural came out. That's it all did. I can remember of 2016. It did. Uh, yeah, so what we'll do is we'll get we'll come to the horror films, but as always, guys, before we get to what was going on in horror in 2016, we are going to look at, just to give a taste of where the world was. So a particular president was elected at the end of uh, 2016, Mr. Trump. Oh, yeah, Mr. Trump. That oh. was a sign of, sign of things to come over the next few years, I should imagine. That's interesting. Can you believe he won that? It's the only time ever I've, I've almost daily looked to see what the President of America is saying. Because he was saying insane things. Because it's just like watching a TV show. 
it's really weird. We've I, got I, missiles. Very still, good I missiles. Still, I still get why some people would vote him. I totally get it because they wanted something different. They wanted. I can't totally get it. It's just not really the person for the job. 2016 was a sad year, not for that reason, but for other reasons. We lost a lot of famous people this year. Are you ready for this list? I was about to say, go on then. Alan Rickman. The sausages are in the fridge. <laughs> Gene Wilder. Is my time straight? Muhammad Ali. Stings like a bee. bee. Leonard Look, Cohen. Those things like butterfly. That's all wrong. Uh, Leonard, Leonard Cohen. Yeah, great, great singer. Has always seemed quite sad when he sang. <laughs> George Michael. Light going to toilets and cottaging. <laughs> Apparently, Carrie Fisher. Oh, yep. And David Bowie and Prince. David Bowie and Prince. Oh, I can't do that. What a fucking year. Yeah, that I remember that. I. I remember that year and everyone was like, who is next? No, that's so pre was before that because actually 2006, I remember that year, that was the year I also moved out my house the first time and I was living above the funeral parlour because I remember I was going to do a mashup of all the people that died and I was doing, I had it lined up. I had some samples from Bowie and Prince and I was going to put it all together like make a song. I never did it. So I remember that. Um, yeah. That year, we covered, um, we did a Gene Wilder special that year in tribute. We did um, Haunted, Haunted Honeymoon. Honeymoon. And. That's right, because the, the day we did Haunted Honeymoon, I went to like a, a, a marriage counseling session that day, and it didn't go well. And I remember I wasn't, God. I was not on top form on that episode. Oh, bless you. Bless your cotton socks. Jesus. Yeah. Well, that was a lot of people that died. Uh, that year a lot of famous people let's see what else was going on in the news there was the huge story about the Russian hacking and the email being leaked um, that happened there was also a little thing in the UK called Brexit oh my god bad, just, bad year. Just, not bad year. E- just Brexit is the most ridiculous ridiculous pathetic thing i i just really is sorry for any listeners who voted brexit it's just it has achieved nothing it's nothing yeah. no positivity whatsoever if anything we've just got less food on the shelves and and less people wanting to deliver it and and things are more expensive it's literally nothing good's come for it i've got a black passport that's it that kind of looks cool could feel like a bit like james bond that's it you should get a passport that says bad motherfucker on it that would be if that was a, a term for Brexit, I'd have been up for it. <laughs> um, we also had um, the Zika outbreak. What, uh, what was that? Z- Zika. It's a d- disease spread by mosquitoes um, to many parts of the world, where the babies were born with tiny little pointed heads. Have you ever seen the Zika babies? Christ, no. This has been overshadowed by a pandemic. Uh, no. Yeah. It mainly happened in Brazil, but it, it happened a lot, and there were, there so were a lot of miscarriages. Like heads. Yeah, basically. Like little that tiny sounds really heads. insensitive of me. It's really sad, actually. It's yeah. awful. Um, also had the Flint, Michigan water crisis. Oh, yeah, documentary about that, yeah. Yeah, so that happened. So again, 2016, not shaping out to be great. Not really, um, is it? It was the start uh, of shit to come. We also had the biggest uh, or the worst mass shooting in US history. In the gay nightclub called Pulse in Orlando. Yeah, I remember that one, yeah. 49 people shot That's and killed. insane. Imagine that like Terminator or something. That is insane. Absolutely horrible, mm. disgusting, um, and crazy, really. Um, what a weird, weird year. It wasn't a very good year. Is there anything positive come out of that year? I, I don't, I'll be honest with you, there's not an awful lot. Um, we also had two black men that were shot and killed by police within two days of each other in July. Um, this was the start of um, black civilians or civilians of colour, especially in America, pulling out their phones as soon as they were approached by police. And, and obviously later on, we would go on to see some more terrible things happen in later years, which we'll get to when we get to those years. But um, this happened as well. And because of that, some police were ambushed uh, in Dallas and Baton Rouge, uh, and five officers were killed in retaliation. 
absolutely crazy. Well, um, yeah, okay, this is the start of uh, getting the history books interesting for future civilizations, isn't it? And because of Donald Trump, do you know what the trending catchphrase was for 2016? The biggest catchphrase that everyone was saying? Fake news, because he coined that phrase, fake news. And now it's a thing, fake news. I don't trust most news outlets anyway. Harambe, the gorilla, was also in the news this year. Do you remember Harambe? No. Everyone went crazy because they killed this gorilla. Uh, um, oh, yeah. Because a boy fell into the enclosure um, and they killed it for no reason. We didn't know if it would have killed the boy or done anything to the boy. So they killed the gorilla. Yeah, and another really sad thing happened this year. Fucking hell, Dan. Ghostbusters came out. It was fucking <laughs> awful. Me and you went to watch it at the cinema and we walked out of there. And not because of any gender, that's for sure. It's just, a, it's just a slack, slack film. Something good that did come out of this year, though, Gav. Please, it's Christmas. Be merry. Pokemon Go came out and everyone had it on their phone. But I did it. I fucking... Well, you didn't have kids old enough. I was wandering around the streets fucking <laughs> with my kids looking for fucking Pokemons. And, uh, of course you were. Whatever, whatever they are. Little <laughs> yellow things and that. Um, yeah. yeah, so I haven't really got any good news, really. Okay, well... It was great. pretty hey. shit year, right? Ooh, everybody happy out there? Ooh. All right, well, let's take, get a taste of what was going on in the, the major box office. Yeah. Uh, we had a sequel. It was the number one film uh, this year. It was Finding Dory. Oh, yeah, it's not bad. Uh, also, Star Wars was back. We had Rogue One, I, Star Wars I, Story. Uh, to be honest, out of all the Star Wars that come back, I think that's my favourite one. Yeah, it's a really good one, actually. It's just one because of the best. they didn't have to fucking, like those fucking Marvel movies, just make loads and loads, and it's just oh, it's... God. Captain America Civil War came out the third Captain America movie that was the number three I, I, I saw that one. and then skipping through things like Deadpool Batman vs Superman Suicide Squad Doctor Strange there was a lot oh my god I wasn't Superman going to the cinema then that year yeah we had a Star Trek movie we had Jason Bourne um, came out Sausage Party Bad Moms um, oh I saw Bad Moms I hate that it's that, terrible it was that was, hate the, that was the ending of my marriage actually <laughs> Because it wasn't my idea Bye. to go. And I was sitting there and uh, actually, they did apologise to me and say, sorry, I took you to see that. Because we had free cinema tickets. Should have gone to watch Sausage Fest. Yeah, I've still not seen that, actually. So there we go. That was the major films. Let's have a look at God. 2016 horror. You ready for horror for Please, 2016? Please, at the moment, I want to erase 2016. In my personal life, it wasn't good either. Go on, go on then. <laughs> well, let's start with a film that you still want to erase. I'm talking Rob Zombie's 31. Oh what a terrible God. piece of shit. And I uh, please, though, listeners who will be uh, on the patrons when we're going back through the episodes, bring out our old episodes. Eventually, you get to the get to my one <laughs> where I interview Richard Brake and and just just say and just flate Rob Zombie. Oh, it's a great film. And then some. I don't know why I haven't seen it since. But I've then a few it days twice. later, I must have just woke up and went, "What the hell was I talking about?" I was hyped by crowd and talking to Richard Blake. Break. Mm. <clears throat> well, we did have a couple of good ones come out this year. We had Split, M Night Shyamalan and Split came out this year. Yeah, that's right. James um, McAvoy's decent actor in that. We had Rule, the film about the girl who accidentally becomes a bit of a cannibal. Have you watched that? No. Very, very good. Uh, the Void, which I know is quickly becoming a cult favourite. I'm a big fan of The Void. Um, Ooh, very. very it does pop to my head. Did you see that? I saw recently a movie called. Did I just speak about it in the last episode? Uh, a movie called The. Oh, for fuck's sake! It's I've the one where it's the, uh, the 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 house is a found footage movie, and they go the house is underwater. The deep, the deep house. The deep house. Did I talk about that on last episode? Uh, I don't know if yes, you, you you touched on it briefly. Oh, okay, heard, then I won't, I won't, I won't again. Then I won't it. again. It's good. I've heard it's very good. You just you just tweaked my memory. Go on. I think one of the best horror films to come out in 2016 was Train to Busan. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Which um, we've covered in our I, Korean episode. I've not seen that sequel. Oh, it, oh, it's really good. Oh, okay. uh, yeah. Yeah. Oh. Peninsula. Um, and they're doing a remake called Last Train to New York, which is a great title for a horror film, but I don't need a remake of Train to Busan. Just make an, uh, a horror movie called Last Train to New York and just have it uh, your own movie. 
Exactly. Um, Lights Out came out this year, about the uh... which was just a short film, which very, very, very easy but effective. Scare. I feel like the short film is better than the actual because yeah, well, you don't need a feature film because you the short does what it is. That is it. That's all you needed. That f- short film. But it was so popular, but people were like, we can make money out of this. So, and they probably did. So, Talking of Korea just now, another Korean film that came out this year, which I know you're a big fan of. I think, actually. Uh, the Wailing came out this year. I think you're a big fan of that. Really big fan of that movie. I need to watch really it again. Good. Have you seen it? Yep, absolutely loved it. Yeah, really good. Real slow bread. I love the detective. I love like Korean t- detectives. Two hours, 40 minutes, mate. I love, me and Korean detective films, I love detective films. Anyway, but Korean ones, I don't know what it is. Have you, st- have you seen The Cop, The Gangster, and... I haven't got right into it yet. Cop, The Gangster, and The Devil. Yeah, watch that film. Good, yeah. Good movie. Uh, another film I really liked, Slow Burn, was A Cure for Wellness. I don't know if a lot of people enjoyed that. I really... I didn't mind it. I saw it on an airplane. Yeah, it's quite good. Um, Hush came out this year. I, I, think, I think I went to LA in 2016, actually. So oh, was, right, okay. So actually, that's not a bad thing. Um, Hush. Which one's Hush? It's about the girl, the deaf girl in the house who's been mm, stalked. Good film. Yeah, very good film. Um, Netflix original. And it's funny, we had Lights Out, we had Hush, and we also had Don't Breathe, uh, which was about the blind guy uh, in in the house who's ended up with a very interesting thing in his basement, if you haven't seen it. Go oh, watch yeah. it. Turkey baster. <laughs> yep, indeed. Uh, another film which I really like, The Boy, came out this year, uh, but the little doll. No, I've seen it. I don't, I don't know. It's like, it's like movies with monkeys. Not really into movies with dolls either. I like Chucky, but... What about monkey dolls? Monkey dolls, no way. What about a monkey doll with a clown face? No, it's really going to really gonna tap me out there. Okay. Um... The Autopsy of Jane Doe came out in 2016. Watched it again recently. That, um, that was something I had to order because I really enjoyed it, actually. And it's, it's a good film. We're going to do that, aren't we? Or We're going to cover that because the director also did Troll Hunter, very different film mm-hmm. and a lot of fun. Mm-hmm. And we're going to do both of those films because I think they're both good films to chat about. Yeah, I think we can get a, a conversation out of them. Yeah. Uh, what else came out this year? Uh, Ouija. The Origin of Evil. Let's forget about that, shall we? Um, another film we covered, which came out this year, was The Girl with All the Gifts. Oh, yeah. As well. We, I really like that film. That's amazing. Yeah, that's I went cool. to the cinema this year to watch Blair Witch. I went to the cinema to watch Blair Witch, too. I like that movie. And I did like it. And then when I watched it again, I didn't like it. I've watched it a couple of times, and uh, I, I actually kind of like it. I'll have to watch it again. Uh, um, I'm a found footage fan, though, so that was a yeah. higher produced found footage film. Um, so, um, in in the canon of found footage films, sometimes it's nice to get a bit more. And that's Adam Wingard, wasn't it? I really got swept up in it while I was at the cinema with the, you know with the, all my friends and everything, and I thought that was cool. But afterwards, I was like, meh. Um, Conjuring Two, another one of those came out this year. Um, a great movie which our friend Andy recommended to me. A Dark Song. Um, have yeah, you seen I've, that? No, it's an Amazon Prime. I've not seen it. Fuck. <coughs> it's really good. Really, is it har- really. harrowing? It is a little harrowing towards the end. Yeah, really good. I, 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 I'm I, getting too sens- sensitive in my old age. Oh, um, no. I think I think you're like that. I okay. think you're like that. I get put off easy by something. Some of the stuff Sarah watches. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, uh, the Purge Election Year. No, I, no, again, I don't know if I've really seen this one. Again, though, I like the Purge TV series for that, like I said last time. That whole like, expanding liked, everyone's uh, ideas on, on that eve of the Purge. I, I don't know, I haven't really watched it. Is it any good? I, I, I can't remember if I've seen it. I've seen, I know I've seen the no. first two Purges, maybe three. I don't know which one this is. Frank Grillo in it. No, that was the second one, I think. Okay, I watched a good movie with him the other day, quite like Demonic. It's, I like Frank Grillo. It's free on good. IMDb TV. But yeah, Demonic's not bad. He's a detective in that, and they go into the house and he just finds loads of dead bodies, and then they just get a, uh, they go through the camera tapes, and uh, well, they've got one of the guys in custody. It's quite good. Check it out. Oh, I've heard that's good actually. It's not bad. Hmm. The Shallows. Yeah, the shark one. Yeah. Yeah, good, good little shark movie there. Good little shark movie there. Resident Evil. Alan Rickman, <laughs> Resident Evil: The Final Chapter. Thank fuck. That new Resident Evil's getting dissed a bit. Yeah, I heard that. Um. Pride and Prejudice and Zombies. Yep. 
The Love Witch, which we co- we covered, came out in 2016. Yep. We did that for a Valentine's special. Um, and, of course, the Christmas movie, Better Watch Out. Better Watch Out. Um, I beat the Undead as well, but uh, let's not talk about that. So, yeah, there was... It's an interesting batch of films. What's happening is horror has become stale. It's not moving forward. Because even though Blair Witch was a great film for you, like, it's still a pretty much a reboot or a remake. Well, you, you do have... Even though, you know, films take a long time to make when it's been... The idea of it being written to when it's actually fucking released in the cinema. It could take fucking years. But it's so funny, quite often, if you look through time, uh, what's going on, social social commentary, and not the social commentary, just what's going on in the world as well, the sort of feel of it, and that year's not been that great, so the movies were, like you're saying now, it's not that great, and it's kind of like, mm. it's just that whole year in general, isn't it? I think the best films that came out this year are either foreign language films, like Train to Busan, um, or small independent films like The Void, um, or The Girl with All the Gifts, that was a very under the radar almost british feeling very felt low mm. budget but it was, it was bigger you know you know what we should have done every year when we've sort of just discussed years i found this quite interesting we should give them each year out of 10 yeah and then they come up with like 2013 was fucking the best year it was fucking amazing everybody had a great old that year like everybody did universally you know that'd be funny so for me, I would say my favourite two films are probably The Autopsy of Jane Doe yeah, agree. Uh, and um, The Train to Busan and maybe The Void, if I was going to say top three for and this I, year. I, I liked, and I liked uh, Blair Witch. There was another film which everybody raves about and I forgot. Terrifier came out this year yeah, as well. Yeah, I've not seen it. It's clowns, isn't it? I really don't like it. I know a lot of people, I know Sarah likes it. I know a lot of people like it. I didn't like it very much. Okay, I won't tell anyone. There we go. Cool. Well, that was 2016. Weird year. Both in real life not and very jolly in film. I'm going to say no. if you are Father Christmas you're a bit shit because I don't feel jolly well hopefully the following year will be a better year 2017 but we'll find out in the next episode for now Gav I yep. can just ask you to take your seat back in the time machine right I'm in oh, locked in Ooh. oh ready oh oh, oh. 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 listen honey when you land can we check into a hotel or leave the kids with your parents Order some room service. You're on, Lieutenant. I see you in about a half an hour, honey. Jingle bell, jingle bell, jingle bell rock. Christmas Eve. Is there a cop on duty around here? Airport police. Go get him. Jingle bell swing and jingle bells ring. Washington, D.C. International Airport. What's this about? Oh, just a feeling I have. Ouch. And you get those feelings, insurance companies start to go bankrupt. The towers lost control. Instrument landing system is down. Backup systems won't come up. We've got blizzard conditions. Zero visibility. Attention all controllers. We have a code red alert. There's panic in the air. This is a professional mercenary. You got the world's biggest drug dealer on his way here now. What do you need, a slide rule to figure this out? You get the hell out of my office before I throw you out of my damn airport. And terror on the ground. Who is this? Who I am is unimportant. What I want is very important. Oh, we are just up to our neck in terrorists again, John. But for police officer John McLean, what I'm right. It's just another Christmas. You're the wrong guy in the wrong place at the wrong time. Story of my life. Caught ourselves for maybe two hours. After that, those planes low on view aren't going to be circling. They're going to be dropping on the White House lawn. Any attempt to restore your systems will be met by severe penalties. Somebody out there! It's for Clay! Blow it up! Wife's plane? They're going to run out of fuel in 90 minutes. What are you going to do? Whatever I can. Last time, it blew you through the back wall of the theater. Got a cowboy right too rough? I don't like the fly. What are you doing here? I don't like the moves either. This time, ah! it'll blow you sky high. Is what you expected? No. This is just the beginning. On July 4th, Die Harder. Bruce Willis, Die Hard 2.
Die Hard 2 from 1990. Rated 15, two hours, four minutes. Die Harder. Die Harder. Ooh. John McClane attempts to avert disaster as rogue military operatives seize control of... Uh, what? Dallas. Dallas. International Airport in Washington, D.C. Didn't know. I thought it was Dallas. That's why that really confused me. Well, what can I say? Uh, when I was younger, um, it, around the same sort of time, I discovered Die Hard. I probably would have discovered Die Hard too at the same time because um, oh, how old was I? I was 13 at this, this point. This was 1990. I was 13. So I probably around the same time on Sky Sky Movies, they'd been showing these sort of films and just going, what the hell is this? In the, in the throes of the a- action movie, obviously this is the 90s action movies coming out in the 80s. Die Hard came out as just like, in, and it still is, I wouldn't even be arguably really. I I could state it is the best action film because of so many factors in the movie make it that. Um, it is, I'm not going to go would, into it now. If I just step in briefly, all yeah, I would yeah. quickly say, and then I'll let you continue. Is I agree. I it's probably Die Hard is probably the blueprint for the modern action film. Everything that came after it tried to emulate yeah. it. Yeah, yeah, it's got because all you those had bits, the right bits. You had John claude Van Damme doing it in an ice rink. You had Steven Seagal doing it on a boat. Keanu was, Reeves on a, a, a bus. Exactly. People would go, "Oh, it's Die Hard on a bus. Die Hard on a this. Die Hard on a that." Yeah. Well, that's that was the coin phrase which was uh, put to executives when you had a script. That was the easiest one to go to. You know. Sorry to interrupt you. Please continue. And I'm not going to go into now. But the original Die Hard is a great, great film. Um, obviously, we covered it. This, go back and listen to the episode. Yeah, this was obviously a very big hit for the company, the original Die Hard. And um, to make the money, Fox was there because it's the Fox Building. Um, that money they made. Think of that saving the money on location filming at the Fox Building. Brilliant. Yeah, and the fact that um, uh, it was inevitable coming from uh, a decade of Rambo 1, 2, 3, Rocky 1, 2, 3, so forth, so forth, so forth, um, that there was going to be a Die Hard 2. And personally, I it's obviously not as good as the first. I have this, but I have a soft spot because it's nostalgia of this as a teenage boy in England, you know, I haven't, been married, I haven't done much travelling, there was no internet, I wasn't travelling with my mind via the internet to around the world seeing pictures of everywhere we don't know this was to me an all american action film do you know what i mean this was just Mm -hmm. really good and it just fell perfectly in there and i didn't like it as much felt a little bit more long drawn out it wasn't such a tight uh space like a tower it was an airport I still like the single location bit of it. Um, I think it's the only movie I know of which is shot completely at an airport. I'm sure there's loads of us. Um, Dan, thoughts? So, uh, I agree. Uh, this is almost as good as Die Hard. Die Hard is probably a 9 out of 10 film for me. This is probably like a 7.5, but that's high for a sequel. Um, this was the only other Die Hard. The net, the third Die Hard film is is good with Samuel L. Jackson. It's still fun, but this was the only other one apart from the first one where it feels like it's a bit more grounded in reality. Uh, it doesn't push the boundaries of what John McClane can do. He's not. He's still an everyman in this film. He's still fucking up. He still trips over. He still misses people. He still loses punch ups. Um, but somehow he manages, just for sheer stubborn and determination, he still manages to overcome everything, right down to the fact that, you know, he uses his cigarette lighter at the end and all that business. It's just, it's great. It, it What it does is it expands on the first film. And I always forget, it doesn't just take place in one location. By the end of this, you've expanded quite far out from the airport to the church, to you know the runways under the runways so it does expand it out a bit more it's a much it feels like a much bigger film you can feel the money you can see the money on screen it's got a great cast it's got some weird people in the background it's got robert patrick popping up in the background at one point or a couple of points you know there's a few people in this here and there william sadler naked with his nutsack swinging around while he does some kung fu in a hotel room as a teenage boy watching that scene i was always a little confused why does he all be naked i know i didn't it know what doesn't he was doing. actually make his character any more or less i guarantee william sadler said and for this scene i'll be doing it naked and the director was like uh, 
Well, okay. maybe because the director's now Remy Harlan and is Finnish and European, maybe it's just like, we need some balls. We need some balls. Brilliant. Uh, and taking over the directing role from John Matirin, who had done Predator as well, basically making the 80s blueprint, like you say. Um, oh. Remy Harlan. Um, yeah. So... Um, it's just a great movie. Should we just get into it? Do you want to get into it? Yeah, I just want to talk about Rennie Harlan very quickly, if I may. Um, Strange Career, Nightmare on Elm Street 4, The Dream Master, then straight into Die Hard 2. Then he did a few other bits and bobs. Then he did Cliffhanger, so another great action film, actually. Um, Cutthroat Island, which is an underrated pirate movie, in my my opinion, with Gina Davis. He worked with Gina Davis again and did The Long Kiss Goodnight with Samuel L. Jackson, which is a brilliant Christmas action movie. Feels like a Lethal Weapon spin-off. It's an amazing film if you haven't seen it. If this... See, he's done a perfectly fine job at directing. I'm chucking my little director cap on here. Looking at it. If we can go, we go. In, well, if you go in and direct, no, because that makes me sound really poncy and like a stuck-up cunt when you say that. Like oh, because I, I, you know, I don't in any way consider myself a director, but I, I'm, whatever. Anyway, <laughs> I know what you mean. Yeah, do you know what I mean? I'm you not like stuck that. Stuck-up cunt. I'm joking. Um, it's if you've got the the same producers being Fox as the original, um, you then more than likely going to have a lot of the same team working on the film possibly because it's made quite quickly they still be in roles in that company so the film would almost make itself do you know what I'm saying I don't feel you're going to have to tell people so many things to do like I feel like this they knew what they were doing it, it, it like the blueprint had been there already if it you know so it would have been really interesting if this film actually had been directed by someone a little bit more um, come from that background, maybe a little bit more. They're very lucky with saying? this film. I do know what you're saying. They're very lucky, though, with this film. In that. It's good. It's just not really good. But what they're lucky about is the cast, as I've already said. You know, you've got some good people in this, like um, Dennis Franz, who plays uh, Lorenzo. Yeah. It's great, great it's spitting out insults. It's, it's a lot of insults in this. It's, it's great all about, casting. Um, if you, and they bring back Al, and they bring back Thornburg. Acting spot And Holly, on. obviously. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, you, could... you know, so we bring people back, but... Pencil neck. There, there's a decent plot. There's a plot. It's not just a uh, terrorist turn up. There is actually a political agenda. The terrorists are doing this for an actual reason. And there's an amazing point well, the first few years of watching this, you completely forget that Grant and all the Marines are actually working. They're double crossing. And when they slit that guy's throat in the back of the van, it gets me every time. Well, I'm always like, fuck. Who will get to that if you haven't seen this? Some reason, there is possibly is going to be one of you out there who's just like, I'm, I just haven't seen it. It's not really sort of a movie for me. Um, some action feels not be. Um, so we will go guide you through like like shepherds in the night. And the last thing I'll say before we get into the story is they're also very lucky because what a lot of sequels do these days is they go, let's do the joke that worked well in the first film and either just repeat it in a different scenario or slightly change some of the wording. And they do that a few times in this, but it doesn't feel like they're just doing it to sort of, you know, for the sake of it, they do it. It works. It works well. Like, yippee motherfucker. It doesn't matter that... He said that in the first one because it just works so well in this film as well. It's it's when it gets in Expendables too, and you're a bit like, oh. yeah, you know. But no, not at this point here. We're still in the same I mean, well, They did it once, and it was a bit like oh, it wasn't really needed. But and, at the same and, time, it was a very poignant moment of the light and the zippo, and it was a good point in time to do it. The less we say about Bruce Willis's most recent films over the last five years or so, the better, I would say. Uh, well, I did look into it, and um, he's got a deal with like a company. Where it's like they pay him a million, he makes a movie, and they've worked out how they can just keep doing it. So that's what he's doing. Yeah. So that's why all the movies recent nowadays, there's probably no point watching them, but they can make a minute because you can just sell a film beforehand, you can sell it to different territories, and Bruce, Bruce Willis's name's on it. So they, they've worked out this thing. Yeah. And he's only in some of these new films for two or three scenes sometimes. One of our listeners uh, did on Facebook, I did put a thing up saying, why, Bruce? And put up a post that was, uh, explaining sort of this. And then they, they kind of did come back saying, they can do whatever he wants. And I was like, yeah, this is true. So I do apologise uh, to that listener that he can 
anybody could do absolutely what they want to do. My problem is, it's a shame he was a great actor. If he'd gone back to do like he the last time actor. he did something really good, I I thought was really good was that science fiction film Looper. I thought yeah, he did really good. Cool. And and what I'd heard is Bruce Willis, as Kevin Smith had massive problems with him. Um, what he is good with is directing, um, working with directors who are first time directors. It's almost like he goes back to his roots of why he's an actor. Because totally what it comes down to in this whole world, when it comes down to it, take everything and the money away, do you still get pleasure from doing the art, making the art that you exactly. create? Do you, do, if you take the money away, will you carry on doing it? If Are you, you inspired? Won, then the, the, this is why he's choosing the way to get most money. And it's like, yeah, fair play. That, if that's your game, cool. I just wish we could see some old, old Bruce Willis nowadays. Bruce Willis in this Die Hard 1 and 2... And Bruce Willis in The Sixth Sense, are his, and of course Butch in Pulp Fiction, that's his best roles. Butch. <laughs> um, and I'll very quickly just mention again, I know we've already mentioned him, but R.J. McCready, he just covered, weirdly, he dropped yesterday, the day before we record, uh, Die Hard 1. He, he covered that on Bite Size Cinema. Um, and he messaged me saying, I can't believe, and I said, oh, I can't believe we're both covering Die Hard movies. Said, but I don't think I've ever heard anybody talk about Die Hard 2 in a podcast. So I'd be interested to hear what you guys think about it. And he covered some of the stuff we've just talked about, which is Bruce was great. He was good at playing the everyman, a fantastic actor. It's just lately it's all about the money. And you're right, it is, Gav. But I didn't realize this deal. That's an interesting deal. It's almost the same thing with, with Nicolas Cage, but he's gone the other way, where is, people are like, keep making random films, Nick. We will watch everything you make because he's Bruce dials it in every time he's bored he's not interested in the role whereas Nicolas Cage puts 156% into every role that he gets even if the film is an absolute piece of shit the minute, few minutes that he's in it you're like well this is, uh, this is how you do it with Nicolas Cage because funny enough I was chatting to Buddy about him and um we probably figured out it's probably a million pound probably his role as well because I was thinking I get Nicolas Cage in a movie do you know what I mean mm. And um, uh, what it is, apparently when he does a take, he does all the takes that you want him to do. Then he will say, in certain scenes, he'll say, can I get a take f for me? And you let him go. So wow. some films, like Mandy, that's pretty much probably all of the let him go, Nicolas Cage role go takes. Let you do whatever you want and let, you let that My freak God. flag fly, motherfucker. My God. Indeed, indeed. Why? Well, let, let's get into Die Hard 2, Die Harder. Mm -hmm. Straight in with a massive blue title and bold font. Die really, Hard 2, loud noise, bang! It really, it's I an the action up, film. It really punches the screen. You're did like, you oh, freak out and wakes the babies up? <laughs> I did. Yeah, no, I had a loud thing. I think I was like, oh, God, I'm disturbing my neighbour. It was very <laughs> loud. Die Hard. Oh, you're so old. You're so mid -aged. It was very loud when the titles came on. <laughs> Bruce Willis has still got hair in this as well. And I said to Alice... Yeah, oh, that's one of my notes. I said, look how handsome he was. And she went, was? I said, what do you mean? She went, he's even hotter now. He's got no hair. I said, bloody hell. I didn't know you fancy Bruce Willis. So I found something out about my wife watching this film. Yeah, I don't know, I don't know Sarah's opinion. I've, I've, generally, <laughs> me and Sarah watch movies quite often. I'm like... Would you? <laughs> <laughs> it's the would you game. I don't know her stance on Bruce Willis. I got to say, he's like we'll this, the whole shaped head, bearded look is quite sexy, isn't it? Yeah. Hey, I'm pointing to me here, Dan. I, I see you. I see you, my friend. I see you. And you I see do me think you're shaking sexy. my ass. I wouldn't vote your poll. No. Right. We start off with the poor old Bruce. He's getting his car towed because does sorry it does really set the scene it's this really busy you see this is me again american there's like the the whole big yellow cab at the oh no it's not a yellow cab but it's his car getting towed away outside an airport it's really busy and there's a cop and it just looks really hectic and there's loads of snow going down and it really sets the scene for the film continue sorry and he's saying come on buddy it's christmas can you i'm a cop and he's like okay and he's like I'm a, I'm a cop in L.A. And he's like, oh, uh, L.A., nice. And he's like, no, 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 I, but I used to live in New York. Come on, it's Christmas time. And he's like, maybe Santa can get you a new car. And it's like, you piece of shit. They're just or straight away, like, he's just not got the luck. It's funny, though. He starts off with this relationship with this cop, who, who you think is obviously no one. He becomes in the film for throughout the movie. <laughs> he's like, 
Yeah, it's so good. And then later Throughout on, the movie, like, he comes back. This, this is my brother. He's the guy. He's the brother of the airport guy, isn't he? Later on, he's like, yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. Of the Renzo, the, ch- the chief of the airport, of course. And he's in the later on when he's in the um the bar, and he's like, "Oh, hey, I thought I saw." And he turns around, and he goes, "Santa Claus." Santa Claus, and he goes, "Goddamn fucking tourists!" Oh, I have a question about that, but we'll get to it. Um, his pager starts going off. Did you ever have a pager? No, I almost bought one. I, I was like at college. We, we've had this discussion on there before. Yeah. yeah, I had one. I, I was trying to be cool. There's a picture of me floating around the internet wearing a uh, uh, like a tent. Oh, yeah, those white sort of tennis. Hats with a top, yeah, yep. with a pager on it. Yeah, because all the rappers had them around that time I was at college. That, that's and I why thought... I had one because I thought I was trying to be a rapper or drug dealer. And then all of a sudden, mobile phones came out, and I thought, well, why would I want a beeper when I can buy this giant cumbersome mobile phone? Yeah. So I bought a mobile phone instead. Yeah. Um, but well, he, he needs to get to the phone boxes, basically. What yeah, and he's at he's at Dallas Airport, which is in Washington DC. A week. Should, should we explain pages to some people? Well, if you're too young to know what a it's pager a is, it's a primitive device where you could ring a ring a certain number and uh, 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 say a message, and someone would type it out for you. Would you be a receptionist? No, you like, just. I think you just type it. I or swear something. I don't know. that someone typed it. I no. remember doing that, and remember saying something really weird. To someone just for the fucking crack because we're drunk. Christ. <clears throat> yeah. It's basically like phoning up and sending a text message to somebody who could only receive a text message because they didn't have and a phone. And it said what number, or or you just ring with a number and you put your number down, and then they have to get back to a phone to ring you back. It was a, a cumbersome way of communication. Yeah, really. we've moved on so much. Since Slightly. Then. It's a little bit quicker than Pigeon, really. So we get a jarring cut now that goes straight from the airport and the busyness and the bad luck of John McLean straight to... William Sadler's bollocks. William Sadler swinging is, in the sexy, sexy night. He is butt naked, and we've got a blue light on him in this hotel room, and he's doing some kung fu moves. He's very ripped, I will say. He's got a good body. He's doing, but at the same time, I don't know if I needed to see a little bit of nutsack. See, this made me think about it, and I was thinking, should I do some yoga naked? No, because you've got a very long and I nutsack. Do yoga. <sighs> <laughs> Because I work out and do yoga in my living room and stuff like that. Uh, and But I couldn't know because it would be uncomfortable. You'd need like support like a bra. So I'd have to wear boxers or pants. I or... thought you meant you were going to wear a bra while you do it. No. That'd be but... weird. Why is he doing this naked yoga? It, like I said, it does not further his character I know or his it's... character's motivation. Not at one just... point. I will just shout out to Gary Hill because Gary did, when we said we were covering this, he did say, damn you, naked William Sadler Kung Fu. And I agree, damn you. Damn. As a kid, just being so confused. I, it was just, it, honestly, at no point later on does he have to get naked and wrestle Bruce Willis. I thought he might strip off towards the end and fight because Bruce Willis naked. It's like when you're in a movie and you see something, you go, that's, that's going to be the fucking, that's going to be used <laughs> later on at the end of the movie to fight, defeat the bad person. Like no when, point does this nudity. Like when um, Daniel Zun's practicing the crane kick on the beach, you think he's probably going to use that at the end of Karate Kid. I guarantee it's Remy Holland saying, I want you to... Uh, I don't know his voice. I want yeah. you to uh, be naked. We're going to oil you up and have the lights come down from above onto you. Is this your Finnish accent? I fucking don't know. It's really? coming. It's just... I'm channeling it. Well, John calls Holly, who is on the plane... Um, and then there are terrorists all walking down this, this bit of the airport. With, they've all got Christmas boxes. One other thing about naked William Sandler. He oh, does do God. his James He's Bond. not Adam Sandler. <laughs> William, I said William Sadler, Sadler. Yeah, you said William Sandler. Willie Sadler. Willie Sander. <laughs> so there's one thing about Willie Sander. That he's, he does his James Bond move with the remote control and turns the TV uh, off, does, doesn't he? Yeah. Oh, let, let's be honest, we've all done that. We've all done that. Is he so stuck up, though? He's so stuck up. He's, no, I'm going to be naked and do my martial arts. Cut to Robert Patrick and a bunch of other terrorists with Christmas boxes marching through the airport very suspiciously. Well, Willie Sander, he's in front of his little box. Sadler. Winnie Sander. Sadler. <laughs> Just call him Colonel Stewart, please. I'm going to do Stewart. It's going to be a lot easier. Oh, Colonel Stewart. Um, we see him going <laughs> along right in front. 
<laughs> right in front. And he's got this box, and he just doesn't look like someone who's just going to go and give a nice present to someone, does he? Then he's joined no. by left and right, simultaneously coming out in this lovely like view of like a an arrow formation of the blue blue uh, the uh, blue arrows whatever they are red arrows and coming down the corridor all of them coming out of different rooms of these presents all coming together in uniform very soldier like very military like um there's a reason for that isn't they there they are up to some crazy shit aren't they all we need now is arnie to walk out with a box of roses yep. behind them just like in terminator 2 you know that's all we need but yes he gets through on the John, phone who is it Holly! Welcome to the 90s. Hey, Holly. Taps her on the plane. He's amazed that he's using technology. She never thought she'd know John uh, John McClane would use technology to ring someone on an aeroplane. He's amazed. And the lady next to her, the old lady on the plane after the conversation, she says, isn't technology amazing? She's holding a magazine with a lethal weapon poster on it. She she is. I saw that. Lethal weapon. Yeah, she's amazing. They're talking about technology. And then she goes, do you know what I've got? (laughs) Let me show you. And she's got a taser in her hammock. They've just let her on the plane with this, because this is 1990. Just get on the plane with the taser. She says, I used it on my dog once. He lived for a week. (laughs) Fucking hell, what bitch? She (laughs) She tasered a dog. Just just to see if it works. And again, Gav, just like the naked kung fu, you think this taser is going to have to come it back. It comes in it. useful, yes. <laughs> it's going to, it's going to come back. Uh, so, John, Holly's going to be half an hour late uh, at the airport. She's up flying in, and um, there's a slight, just very slight delay. Not much, half an hour. She's going to be landing half an hour. They're going to get a bottle of champagne. Their relationship, though, has it's got back, back on. together. They are fine. The kids are with the parents. He's going to pick her up. They're going back. They go. Lovely Hang on. Christmas. He says to her though, let's. Before we go back to the parents, let's and your get some parents, champagne. Let's get a hotel room and let's uh, let's get sweet loving going on. We need a and chauffeur she... driver from before to uh, come along and give him a little lift with a teddy bear in the back. Dun, 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 dun. It's Christmas time. <laughs> it Harley Green. Um, so they're no. going well, aren't they? Yeah, and they, that's absolutely fine. Very well. He's very happy to pick her up. She's like great. Um, he's still a cop. They're in LA now. And mm-hmm. he's finally settled in with her because he didn't want to do that. He didn't want to be a cop in L.A. He's a cop in L.A. Well, they're in Washington, D.C. for this movie, though. But, yeah, you're right. Um, he starts to notice that uh, there's some suspicious activity going on in this well, airport. And he has already bumped into Colonel Stewart. He says, I recognise you. He said, oh, I get that a lot. I've been on TV. Yeah. No, there's a really great build up of tension. We know something's going on, and if you'd never seen this movie, you'd be like, "Oh, it's, it's all right." I was trying to rem- remember that. Imagine it if I hadn't seen it. It's a real nice upward with the scores, very good, it's very epic. Because there's, there's a bit the alien bit. I think it's a score from Aliens, a little bit of music cue, which is played quite a few times in this, like they did originally in the first one at the end. There's a bit of the dun 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 dun. dun, dun. Mm. You know that bit of music. Yeah. yeah, from Die Hard, yeah. Yeah, and that's in, it's in the sequences in this, not the later on ones, it's in the action sequences against people who are going to be killed. It's not major end ones, but it's used for our, which is a nice callback as well. And we get a side scene where you see a church. We don't know what this church is or what it's got to do with it. That's There's an old man in there. I, I would have that as a picture on my wall. It looks beautiful, doesn't it? Snow. It looks really nice. Snow. And it's, it's got a few it, Christmas lights it, outside. Again, it does give me back a sense of uh, winter as a kid. Watch this movie. It's just nostalgia. The maintenance uh, guys knock on the door. And they say, oh, we're here to just check. Poor guys. Go having some soup, watching some telly. He says, oh, come on in. But you don't see what happens to him. We know he kills the old man. We, we know, know that. it. Because they're going to use this church as their base of operations. <laughs> That's yes, what they're going to do. Because so, essentially, should we, should we say what's going on now with the plot? Yeah, well, let's, let's go for it. Um, so, so basically, they need to set up this uh, operations because... It, see, this is where it comes, because Nick, we know this twist later on. You've already said it, so we're spoiling it if you haven't seen it. But later on, uh, the army that's brought in are actually in cahoots. And it's all planned. So we've got to imagine all of this stuff's all planned. Them get them getting that happening and an army being called, they knew that was going to happen. John McClane just happens to be there as well. It almost it's the wrong does. Place it at almost, the wrong time, Gav. It almost adds up at times. It does get like that can't be right. Do you know what I mean? But and um, so they make this. Um, basically, there's this a drug uh, smuggler, cocaine smuggler, who's also a very uh, b- well, big general. He's more than a smuggler. He's like the 
the drug baron of the world. He's es- his name's Esperanza. Um, and he's, he's going to be worth a lot of money. Yeah. Um, he's being brought in, he's been extradited and being brought into America, f- uh, probably to sort of be on trial. And um, obviously, you've got Army Guy, he's in handcuffs on this air- big old airplane, two, two guys. You'd think there'd be more people if he's that big on that airplane with him, instead of one, one kid. This plane with Esperanza on it... It should be full up with people, surely. It kept reminding me of the plane on the Monster Squad that they're transporting Dracula's coffin on. I don't know why. Probably the same one. They probably use the same prop. Fucking lunatics. Um, anyway, um, so, um, uh, and basically, um, uh, old Stuart, Colonel Stuart, and his men are going to set up an operation and take over, which is just a gnarly, gnarly thing. And what they do is just really fucking full on when you think about it. Take over operations and take out the tower control at an airport. Take control because they want their airplane with this guy in to be taken to where they want to be taken, where they can get him out and they can all safely go away. That is the plot. And the way they do it, the way they're going to do it is they're going to turn off all the runways at Dallas Airport right on top of Christmas. I I was with them in shock, like, what would you do when that happened, you know? Right on top of Christmas, where it's very, very busy, so all the planes are circling above the airport and none of them can land. They're all slowly running out of fuel, and that's how they're going to hold everybody to ransom if they don't get what they want. These planes will start dropping out of the sky. And the Jules reference, the uh, captain of the chief of police uh, at the airport won't shut the airport down. Yep. That is what's going on, and it's quite a gnarly thing for what they end up sort of doing with this. It's real full on, like, we don't really give a fuck. Well, it's terrorists, isn't it? It's proper terrorist activity, yes. I've got to say, like, this and the first one, they feel like real terrorist plots. Hmm. Um, You know, now, this is probably one of my favourite scenes quite early on, is where John. Sees the package. He spots the two guys going into the room and he says to the guy, you well, got a key for this door? It's before that. He's sitting there having a fag. Oh, yeah, um, and he's watching smoking them. Yeah, cig- he's smoking, smoking all the way through. Because it's at the airport and on the airplane, you could just uh, do that. It's, just smoking it's, on the you know, airplane. Smoking a cigarette. And um, is- just, just look at the bar, just looking over, and he just sees these guys who do stick out a slightly sketchy. One of them's, one of them's, touching, one of them's touching his head the old time because he's got an earpiece, which is like checking out the weather report. That's just like, obviously, you know, they put this package down and they swap packages with their feet uh, for whatever reason. Oh, yeah, because they're going to go to this this place. Or, and no, he doesn't swap it, he just kicks over this package. The other one picks up and John McClane sees this and then watches those guys, starts following them, watches them walk into a staff-only entrance somehow. It's because he's never off duty, Gav. John McClane is always on duty. Yes. So he um, he goes up to the uh, door and sees one of the cleaners and is like, uh, yo, have you got a key for this? He says, yeah, why? He goes, because I want you to open it up. Um, I know, I love the way, I love his delivery of that line. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because I want you to open, open the door. Open it up. Um, and he, lets, lets and him he, goes, he says, you got, you got cops? You got an airport cop here? Go get he's him. like, somewhere. And he goes, go get him. He's just so, he's just so good. I feel like... Um, by now, Bruce is really comfortable being John McClane. You really feel it. Well, in this it was a film. couple of years later. Yeah, absolutely. He, no. He's started doing a lot more things as well. Um, he, he, we did say though, you did mention it earlier on, but he, he did in between this. He, after seeing these guys go up to the cops to say, "Hey, officers, I just want to say uh, I saw something," and that's when it's um, it's the guy from earlier giving oh, yeah. the parking ticket. So he doesn't bother saying it, which seems a bit like well, he should still say it. But he, I guess he knows he's an inept policeman, so he's not gonna uh, uh, do a good job with it and that information just to laugh at him so he doesn't bother um but yes he does ask this kid to go and get the security uh cops uh the airport cops and he goes into the room and we're one of these back bits of the airport that we've all wanted to see as a kid with all these huge conveyor belts with luggage all over them flying all around the place and he sees the two of the, the baddies and they're doing something with some luggage and he says hey who are you two you shouldn't be in here and he's like oh That's we, we work here yeah, and they don't work there. They pull out guns. They shoot at John. He shoots back. Yeah, and we get a bit of a shootout and a bit of a punch up, um, jumping on and off with conveyor belts. Uh, John grabs a golf club um, and uses that, but he's not very good at fighting. These, these guys are all. I feel like these they all train naked with William Sadler because they're all quite good at kung fu. 
Yeah, I imagine I have some reg regiments of that. Um, it's a real game of cat and mouse here on the conveyor belts. It's a real good action sequence put together. So, you know, get your hands down, Rennie Holland. It's quite a good sequence put together here. And he loses his gun very early on, doesn't he? That's what you say, he picks up the weapon. It's John McClane. Yeah. He keeps yeah. losing his gun. Yeah. My favourite bit is later on when he loses his gun. Uh, my favourite? Sorry. And it's on the conveyor belt, and he manages to turn the conveyor belt back on, and get his gun just before that guy. Yeah, that's a good. I that's a good. That it's, it's a really I good setup. That, yeah, yeah. Um, I love the fact that as soon as this went down, as soon as he saw, oh, this is how I reckon it went. As soon as he saw the two people and something dodgy going on, going out fingers, they're up some bad guys. I bet he thought to himself, "This gives me fucking chance to get into a little fucking tin box again and go do some crawling around." <laughs> this um, the first thing I, I'm doing is I'm looking for those fucking air vents and I'm getting in them because he can't wait to get in the air vents. How can this shit happen to God twice? He's like, you fucking love that shit. Do so you fuck think he's off. got a bit of a fetish for being crawling oh, around? Yeah, like I reckon it's like a sexual, fa a f a sexual thing where you just get off on being like a little fucking microwave meal. Brilliant. He likes his feet being uh, abused and he likes being uh, put into little tight spaces that we all. Hey, <laughs> Carry on, carry on. So, so, um, what happens next? Uh, well, we realise that well, after while all this is going on in this fight, and he kills a guy, and one of the guys escapes, we cut back to Holly's plane, and who? He's also lost the ID, and the uh, the guy gets away. Just it's a, he gets out of shot, and the, the security cops just put their gun in his face. So, like, hang on, you would have seen that guy run off. He was there literally a second ago. He must literally be about three feet from you. But it's quite funny. Holly's plane, though, who by chance is on the plane. Only Walter Peck from the Ghostbusters. It's true, himself. this man has no penis. Thornburg from the original Die Hard is on there. And he sort of makes a fuss that he needs to get a different seat because he's got a restraining order against Holly. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> not, not her on him, him on her, because she fucking smacks him one. Uh, and I think that's hilarious. Um so he's the journalist, he's an asshole, and he's still an asshole in the this film. The air hostess gives Holly a bottle of champagne. Oh, I know. She's like, why have you got a restraining order? She's champagne. like, because I punched him. She's like, okay, I think you need a bottle of champagne for that. Hell so, yeah. I love it. Um, so we find out, as I've said earlier, the church has been used as a base of operation. It's pretty elaborate. It looks like the bat cave in there now. Uh, the, uh, Bruce Willis is not strings. happy. Old John McClane is not happy that uh, the, the, the area is not being taped off. And he says, oh, the captain says not to tape it off. Take me to the captain. And this is where he goes finds the uh, captain of police at the airport. He's an asshole, isn't he, this guy? Uh, um, he, he, yes and no. He does come through later on. He helps out later on. But he, he, he's just... At the beginning, he's really I, obstructive. I'm going with he don't get laid much at home. His wife's well, not interested anymore. And he's just not happy. He's stressed but, because it's, uh, it's, it's an airport on Christmas week. But John's saying to him, look... You're letting this, that, and the other. Everybody and his cat come come through here. You're not even going to get prints from your own guys, let alone anybody, let alone the, the thieves. But at this rate, and he's like, "Don't tell me how to do my job. Yeah. I know what I'm doing. I can't just he's stop just the stressed. airport." Yeah. And he's like, "It's so they're already at loggerheads. They don't like each other very much. Uh, he doesn't want to investigate this properly." Um, so John thinks, "Fuck this. I'm going to do it myself." So he chases after the guys with the corpse, pretends to work for the forensics. He gets the fingerprints of the corpse, and he sends sends them to his buddy, doesn't he? He's got a buddy. Well, I love how he gets the fingerprints. You've got to tell this. So, so this guy hasn't done anything. They haven't taken prints. This guy, everything. So he's just like, "Fuck this." So he goes up to this this lady at uh, a uh, desk and just grabs her a, a uh, ink pad and some paper and goes just up to the guy. Says, "Hey, hey, guys, hey, on, hey, I just got to get this guy's prints. There's a uh, new FOD from the PSA from the ABC up there, you know, and just gives some load of shit." And they're like, "Shouldn't you be doing this at the morgue?" And he's like, "No, no, 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 it's changed, it's changed, it's changed." And he gets the fingerprints and then he goes and. Goes back to this lady who he, he ends up flirting with a little bit. She definitely definitely wants his die hard. He flirts with her <laughs> though when he when he mouths thank you. Yeah, but he also is married. So yeah, when later she, when on, she he, says he, later on he shows the ring, but no, he said, he's she still says a bit and I love the line when she says to him maybe when I finish and he can get he just goes 
Just the facts, ma'am. And it's a fax, isn't just it? Just the F-A-X facts. and not an F-A-C-T-S. Oh, oh dad jokes. Johnny, Johnny McLean. Anyway, uh, uh, he, he gets this lady's help to fax over to a good old friend of his who is a twinkie-loving motherfucker. He is a twinkie-lover. Al Powell picks up the phone. <coughs> They've still got that rapport between them. They have a good old chat. And he says, put that twinkie down. And I think, is he actually eating a twinkie at the time, isn't he? Uh, he, he doesn't need to, but he goes to get the fax from the other room and, ha- and puts a Twinkie in his mouth while he does it. So it's just popped out does. like a little gopher. Of course he does. Um, and he says to John later on, when he faxes it back, he says to John, well, the guy's been dead. The guy's dead. And John says, well, well done. Of course he's dead. That's why I'm sending you the prince. He's like, no, no, no. Two years ago. He's been dead for two years. Mm. He was a soldier. So John's like, oh, I better go back to the airport HQ here with this. So he reveals the dead guy's ID and he says, there's terrorists. It is, this is a terrorist plot. Yeah, which is, starts- which is his suspicions, obviously. Um, but we, before this, we did have a little bit of a quick thing for us, for our information for us. We had a shot of the pilots of the airplane of this bad dude coming in. And uh, they do just say, oh, we'll be safe now all the way to the American uh, airport. We've got 3.5 hours. Just so we know where we are and how long we've got to the shit goes down. This is where we're at. Exposition time. So we've got three and a half hours now going on. Uh, yeah, so uh, uh, so this is not good to discover this. We, obviously, it's a bit of time we've got, but we, he's discovered that this dude is uh, essentially recorded as dead. Now, that's bad. So does this, Dan, does this old uh, General uh, Stewart, Colonel Stewart, does that mean all of his men were uh, uh, fake killed? Yeah, I would say the majority of them are... Missing in action, presumed dead, mm. gone off the radar for like, a couple like of years. 18. Because this, so this operation's that big and been no, going I, on I for that long. I don't think that it's all for this operation. It I think this is a group of people that do different missions, and this is their latest mission. I it's think they're all off the grid. Team, yeah, yeah, exactly like the eighteen. They're off grid. The presumed dead, missing in action, whatever you want to say. Okay. Uh, you know, and and this is one of the this is their latest mission is to do this. And obviously, uh, uh, the the other team later on, Grant's team, they they are also the same. Oh no, but they're no, they're no, not because they're, they're, they're actually legit. not. But they're, they're going to be wanted men though. All of that. But crap. they're all going on holiday. On they're that all going to be wanted aren't though, aren't they? Yeah. There's no way they can get away from that. But that we'll, we'll cut across that bridge when we come to it. So mm. just as John is sort of trying to explain. He thinks there's terrorists. Of course, the runways start being shut down. And the power, most of the power gets cut by the bad guys from their you, HQ. You're jumping ahead. You're jumping ahead. Once he finds this out, he he, he, he goes up to the, the control tower. He's like, oh, fucking right, I'm going to the control tower. And he confronts us with them up there and says, look, what the fuck? Look at this. And this guy... That's what I said. This... He's got the uh, idea of the, of the dead guy. He's okay. like, yep. can you explain to me? Yeah. You know, this guy hasn't the main guy. The main uh, what is his what's his role? The captain of the, the fat, uh, fat controller. Um, it doesn't actually say his role. Fred Thompson Plank. played by, but he's like the main big chief of the uh, control tower. He, his say he he he, he gives morale to the, to the to the troops. Everything he keeps everything going up there, nice and tidy. He goes up to says what fight, and these are who's this guy? So we've got the chief of police up there. Well, not chief of police, the uh, captain of the police there, uh, Lorenzo. Um, saying like, oh, this is the guy from blah, 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 Willis, and then they explain. Can you explain this then? And then they they don't even need to discuss it. I like the fact that they both uh, are clued up enough to be able to look at that and just go, that's not good. That's really not good. And that is obviously then, as you say, but the runways start getting shut down, down. And, and then the power gets cut. It's, so, it's obviously almost on cue, but it's a great point, and it's a nice point for the Lorenzo to have been like, ah, I should have probably listened to this call. So none of the planes can land, and then, to make matters worse, it's bad. There's, a, there's a phone call. Well, who's ringing that number? And John says, maybe it's the, the guys that are behind all of this. He's got a gut feeling, and they pick up, and of course it he, is. He's been there before in a tower. He, he knows, knows what's, what's going doing. on. And it, he knows, it's it, and John it's William... McLean. It's William, look at my nutsack, Sadler, on the phone, and Willie, he says... Willie Sander. This is what's going to happen. 
Those planes are going to start dropping out the sky unless you do what I say. Yeah. I- I'm currently naked. It's literally like we're, <laughs> sh- yeah, we're shutting down this whole airport. Like, we've taken control. And this is a bad situation. So they're literally like, what are we going to do? Like, this is fucked. And you can imagine how bad and how stressful that would be. John gets kicked out of the room at this point. They get all the planes that can be rerouted to airports closer to them and have got enough fuel to do so, do that. Otherwise, it's a case of all come to the airport and start circling until we can tell you to come down. But planes only have so much fuel. There's probably about 30 planes circling above that airport and they've all got about 90 minutes to two hours worth of fuel. Yeah. It's not not great. So John gets kicked out of the room because he gets into a bit of a... Well, the news again. reporter who followed them up then comes in, so both of them get kicked out at the same time. And this is where he gets all fucking original diehard again. Gets yeah, because she, lift. she's trying to wait to him, and she doesn't seem to realise it. He just starts climbing out at the top of the lift. She has no qualm or no... Uh, no. Uh, <laughs> she's just like, she's used to this shit, I guess. So he climbs up through the lift. Uh, the cops come in. Oh, where's he gone? Oh, shit, he's escaped. And John's John's on the run. He's, he's going to deal with this. And he goes off and finds... A character who I absolutely love, Marvin, who, like, is this guy that sort of is like a rat behind the scenes. He's like a, he knows all the ins and outs of the airport. He's got blueprints of everything. And John goes to him and sort of says, I need, I need the blueprints. I need to know where everything in the airport is. And this guy's got every map. You know, he knows, he's like Charlie in that one scene in um, It's Always Sunny in Philadelphia with all the things on the board and the string. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. He's, he's like that guy, but it's all about the airport. He knows he's a bit like Charlie, connected. I can imagine, yeah. Yeah, this is Charlie when he's older. He'll work for the Dallas airport. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And he'll be helping John McClane. <laughs> um, uh, just before this, uh, the, the nerds of the control tower realised that they could probably actually bypass the terrorists the uh, nerds the, you call them nerds <laughs> uh, bypass the terrorists uh, control of the uh, the audio community community for the uh, for the airplane pilots and stuff and, and bypass it by using a, another transmitter to communicate so they actually go like let's get over there so they start going we can go to this place where there's already one blah 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 yeah they have to take they have to take it in a suitcase directly to the other satellite and to plug get it in up. and get that stuff. But obviously this mandy. has been thought of by the bad guys. So yeah. there is, in fact, and John knows this, in fact, there's going to be a... An ambush. An ambush. Because the, as the suitcase guy... There's going to be Kate Bush just there singing uh-huh. away. Wherever, Imagine that. Over in heights, oh, yeah, oh, yeah, oh, oh. running up that hill, running, running up that hill. Um, well, running up the escalator is what happens because the guy with the suitcase, the, the, the nerd, as you you called him, nerd. Uh, he gets suddenly Robert Patrick. He says, Robert Patrick says, "Hey, that guy says to Robert Patrick, hey, buddy, turn around. What do I look like to you?'" And he turns around, and he goes. A sitting duck. A sitting duck. And he just blows him away. And so there's a shootout here. Luckily, John McClane overhears this shootout. And, and, you... and, and luckily, John McClane's had his finest moment and he's found his air vent and he's just happy as a pig and shit. He's like, come out to the coast, but have a few laps. And uh, he joins in with the, the shootout. Well, he, he pushes an air vent down onto Robert Patrick and, and kills his uh, acting in this movie. And he also pushes over one of those sort of scaffolding things that painters use, and he it lands on a man's throat. It kind of almost beheads a man. Uh, but then, then John seems to be stuck under some scaffolding. Now, I don't know if you've ever experienced scaffolding, Dan. It's very light. Scaffolding yeah, is really, this really a fucking lot. light. This happens a lot in films. You could I've, just pick it up. I've seen many a Jackie Chan film where he gets thrown into a bookshelf and the bookshelf lands on him and he can't seem to crawl out from under it. No. It's all to do with, you know, it's for the film. But yes, but he struggles to get out from under a piece of wood. with your finger over. But luckily, his gun is on the conveyor belt. So he uses a pole to turn the conveyor belt on. So his gun is literally brought to him like a little present. Just and the, the other the guy, guy gets... sees it and he's oh no, and he starts running towards him. And obviously, it's the really belt's coming towards him, so his, his sprint is like that much faster. And it's like a threat. It's a very good action scene. And this is here again. The dun 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 music plays. I know what you mean. It's great. It's a really good scene. You're really with John. Um, 
I love that moment. That's a great moment. Ah, little breather there after that. Now, back on the plane, Gav. Yeah. Walter Peck, old Dickless himself. Thornbury. See, this is what I do. This is my gift. People want to know. I see things. and People want to know these things. He's noticed the plane's out the window, hasn't he? Yes. There's, there's something on the wing. There's something. Oh, no, that's Twilight Zone. He's noticed there's other planes circling. And Holly's like, yeah, what is going on? It's like a bit of a traffic jam out there. It, it is a bit odd. And I'd shit was, if I saw that out the window, I'd think, ah, this isn't good. No, so, because like that that's re- if you just keep looking out your window for the next half an hour and it's just the same thing, you're like, that means we can't land. I've seen one or two planes out of the window of the plane I've been on, but they can see about six or seven or eight planes. Yeah, 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 yeah. No, circling it, with them. <clears throat> have you ever had any bad airplane situations? Uh, obviously, I, obviously turbulence we've all gone through sort of turbulence you know, everything like yeah turbulence fairly bad. have um, you had an airbag, airbag come down or anything or, uh, no I had I had one airbag. funny moment in Japan where as we were walking onto the as we were boarding the plane we hadn't taken off obviously because everyone was still filing on there was a massive earthquake wow um, and that felt crazy. Mm. Uh, and the lady just said to me, oh, that was an earthquake. The, the air stewardess, she said, oh, it's an earthquake. And I was like, okay, she was, it's fine, it's fine. We get them all the time here in Japan. But I was like, fucking hell, that was weird. The only other thing I had once was the, I think I was coming back from Canada. And we had some turbulence, which I've dealt, I'd dealt with before. But one guy started freaking out screaming and there was children on the plane and he was really said we're gonna die we're gonna fucking die help me help me he he was lost his mind and they really had to try and calm him down and there was kids that were getting upset and actually even though i knew that we were going to be fine because it was just a bit of turbulence he made me panic a bit and i thought are we are we gonna die is it is that what's gonna happen isn't that funny though that's that's just that suggestive uh uh uh, thing going on it's horrible it's it's very very common for that uh, that crowd suggestiveness to happen from one thing just domino effect to another that that like sense of panic very easy no no no, not really i slept for an earthquake in san francisco but no of um because it's such a one of those things um no not really not like i think of i think most airplane rides have been pretty good do you know, several years ago, there was an earthquake right here in Bristol. Mm, do you not know? Uh, I was washing up in the kitchen of what, this house. What was it? Two, three? I have no idea. All I know is I was washing up mm. and I, I, I didn't so much as feel something. I just sensed something weird. And then a couple of things, like a pen and something else, fell off a shelf in the kitchen. Do you think it's ghosts? And I thought, that's a bit weird. Didn't think much of it. And then about an hour later, it was like, earthquake in bristol felt by lots of people and i thought oh that was it that was what i felt how strange yeah weird let's get back to the movie let's get back to die harder so they are freaked out a little bit by what's going on out there so they discuss it a little bit well he's got a buddy hasn't he who's got um equipment that this can tune into the pilot's well, radio one of his crew members because he's a reporter for tv he's like you know have you still got that stuff he says i've got what oh, of course i've got stuff wouldn't let those idiots pack my stuff it's so brilliant can you uh can you radio into the uh, cockpit and listen? He says, of course, can. Right, get on it and let me know if you hear anything weird. Oh, okay. And that's what he says his buddy to do. McLean speaks to Colonel Stewart. He got a bad uh, walkie-talkie of the bad guy that he shot. Yep. And he says, ho, ho, ho. Now I... Ha- oh, no, he doesn't say that in this one. Sorry. He speaks to him and he... But Colonel Stewart calls the planes in to land no he can't speak to him because the code the walk is a coded he's really pissed off later on he's super oh, happy when he gets right. one he, he do can't do anything at the moment all he can do is listen so he listens they him and marvin listen to what's going on which is him pretending to be the uh air traffic control and saying come on in and he, we lost you for a few moments there but you're welcome you're good to land now come oh, no, on in come well, on no, in no before that he, he he comes onto the um he comes onto the control and says hey hello dallas airport All right, okay this is what's going to happen but uh, you haven't been playing the game properly now we need to explain to you john mcclain then gets on another talkie and just butts in the conversation which kind of provokes <laughs> him a little bit to say okay i'll show you what we could fucking do yeah and he doesn't fuck about goes to a london airplane which is bound for coming in from a uh, heathrow or gatwick or something uh, um, from London and 
says to him like, "Okay, you you're ready to come in there." Goes, "Thank God, we've been worried. Where have you on?" Is this little... the um the guy from Star Trek? That's the pilot, isn't it? Yeah. Security, yeah. Uh, yes, yes. Uh, he's in some gangster movies as well. Got Richie ones, I think. And everyone um, in it is very British. Oh, no, he's in layer cake with uh, then everybody Craig. in this is like, uh, "Oh goodness me, we're uh, going well, to be landing now." Well, lovely. We like British Rail love. We we may be late, but we get you there. Oh God, fucking crash that place! Eighties and eighties <laughs> and British Rail were being late was like the most important news going on at the time. There's nothing else really. Um, and um, so they just they recalibrate the sea level by two hundred feet. So basically, the aeroplane thinks they've got another two hundred feet to go down, and they haven't. And it's so clouded and that and foggy, they can't really see it until it's too late. And John McClane's like, "Oh my god!" So he gets over to where this is going to be going on, and he gets a, a gets a oh couple of sticks on fire, climbs up this fucking vent, and just starts waving because there's no lights for the aeroplane and we've got no signal to go down. They say, who's that? Who's that on the runway? I think that's it's McLean. It's McLean! Yeah. That and he, what, a, what a fucking hero trying to do that. But that plane, when it's a it good hits... Idea. It's a really good it, idea. When it hits the runway, it's it bad. just... I like, it just goes up. This is a movie which you're not looking at CGI with explosions. You're looking at some big explosions. And it's, also, it's, it's a sort great. of movie you, you don't watch before you get when you're on a plane, really. No, Sarah, don't watch this. Because the reason that plane. that goes up in so much fire, that plane, is because planes carry jet fuel. And jet fuel is so flammable. That this plane just goes up in a giant fireball. It's on the wings, isn't it? Yeah. Um, it's just. And this is the terrorist's version of. This is what Hans Gruber did in the first Die Hard movie when the Nakatami guy said, Look, I don't, I'm not going to play ball with you. He said, Okay, no problem. Bang! And he killed him. Yeah, it was showing him a lesson. Is, this is him showing him a lesson. You. Yeah. Just to show you. Um, I needed to do it once. And. And, you know, it's a real cunt move, the fact that he just brings them in so calmly. We've got you. We've got you. Come in now. No worries. Here you come. We've got you. Boom. It's just like, wow. And so they're just like, this is not good. And John did provoke them a little bit, but they were going to do it because they said, this is a lesson now. Don't do it again. John actually cries um, here. He's angry, but he cries at the same time. That includes our lesson this evening. And oh, it's say. horrible. Mm. Uh, and he cries. And this is not the first time we've seen John cry. He cried in the first movie. He wanders around now, fucked up. It's almost like the end of the movie and he's lost. He yeah. re- he really just wanders around a bit like, what the fuck? And he's thinking, because obviously he's thinking about his wife's going to crash and be this the same as these people. He almost, um, there's what part where he sat on the steps when they're going through the wreckage and they've got a blanket around him, and it's almost like he almost expected his wife to be on that plane. Yeah. He, he's treating it like, that was my wife, but it wasn't. Well, he, he, he knows that. He's, he realised he's helpless. There's um, no survivors, Peck, you know, no survivors at all. Peck, Peck's fella, who's got the receiver, um, says that it's really weird. There's nothing coming from Control Tower. It's just a beacon. Beeping. Beep, beep. Beep, mm. beep. Beep, beep. And that's wrong. So... If I was up there, though, and I was Peck or one of these guys, I would have that... You know, when you... when It was like that moment when we collectively had that what-the-fuck with this coronavirus. You, all of us would have had that one moment where our gut stomach just feels a bit like, oh, I feel a bit sick and a bit like, what the fuck? Or, this feels you know, weird. That, that's, that's that. If you're up in an aeroplane and like that, that would be where all of a sudden you're like... Okay, life's changed now. Okay, material objects don't mean anything anymore. Uh, my loved ones mean things to me. Uh, and do you know what I mean? That's when that's like... And it's just like, oh, my God. I would freak out if I was up there. I wouldn't be like... But Peck's like, oh, yeah, this could be my greatest part for news. I'll be made... To the... He'll be dead. Uh, it's crazy the way he's... his career overshadows his fucking... We should also mention that the air traffic control boss sees John after that this explosion and goes up to him and says, look, Holly's plane has got 90 minutes of fuel. So he says he wants to like let him know like she has, she's not dead, but she's got 90 minutes of fuel on her plane. Just wants to let you know. Mm. So he knows that. And again, Gab, like you said earlier, when they said we've got 3.5 hours, now we know we've got 90 minutes for Holly. So the, the film is again informing us of where we're at. Yeah. Um, the army arrives. This is uh, General Grant. 
in played their helicopters. John Amos. Yes, and they... John Amos, uh, who was in Coming to America, The Fresh Prince of Bel Air. Seen him in lots of things. Very as, intimidating man. As you know, you know, I like with movies. I like it when the cavalry comes in. It gives you that little. In a horror movie, it's more obviously it's better in a horror movie because it's a lot more hardcore and sense. Um, and this is an action film, but it gives you that sense of oh great, these guys are going to help us out. And there's a bit of a back and forth for a moment between Grant and McLean. A little bit, a little bit. Who um, the hell are you? I'm John McLean. Oh, yeah, I've heard all about you with an academic plot. So he's a bit famous surely, from the first movie. Before this all happened, Colonel Stewart must have been on the phone with uh, Colonel Grant and been like, right, there's this John McLean character. Does he, he doesn't even know about John McLean. So this, this Grant guy must be like the best actor in the world. He has to freestyle this whole repertoire back and forth with him and getting on his side and becoming a bit more trusted later on. Get this yeah, guy let, out of McLean's face. Uh, I thought you were Lorenzo. an asshole. Yeah. You're just my kind of asshole. That's why he says just after the Lorenzo bit. Get him out of Mr. McLean's face. This bureau cat out of Mr. McLean's face. Yeah. And um, so it's really amazing that really then he can actually freestyle his acting and, and have this whole thing going off on his head as well as everything else going on. So, you know. Uh, it, and, and to bullshit him further, he says, John, all we're here to do is take down Colonel Stewart, and we will we will do that no matter what. And you're like, oh, okay, well, these guys like, mean business. But they must be know. like, who is this fucking dude? Like, fuck's sake, he's who like, is this is sleepy cop with dirt all over him? Who's bit smoke? Always smoking cigarettes. <sighs> Holly, he yeah. hasn't even got any fucking shoes on. <laughs> and a vest. Um, the uh, yes, the airport secret signal, and uh, they figure out that there's a way. Just to jump ahead, they figure out that there's a way that they can use that signal to broadcast, uh, you know, a voice signal. We, so can, that... we can pump up the wattage. Okay, let's do it. Oh, it's all technical bollocks, but it works in these sort of films, doesn't it? Yes. It's always like let's reverse the polarity, and then and it's like, what does any of this mean? Let's cross the streams. Who fucking knows? So Just they managed. So they managed to do it, and but this time, obviously, Pex Pex man's on on patrol and listening and monitoring what's going on. Hears this and says, "Quick, listen to this," and he's recording we keep it on him tape. Peck. <laughs> uh, yeah, uh, and, <laughs> and uh, he's recording it, uh, and basically they're saying, "Okay." This is what's going on. I've been I've been told this is Barnes. He says I'm now in control of uh, telling you guys exactly what's going on from a, from five o'clock this afternoon or blah 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 blah. Explains what's going on. Peck's like great. This is this is my t- chance to shine. I c- get me phoned in on the telephone to the live on air to the breaking news Ugh. story. Blah blah blah. Because he's a twat. And what's great about that scene when we just to jump ahead is when he's doing that. He starts actually looking in the mirror himself and like running his fingers through his hair. And he's going, but This is he, my duty to inform you I all. I love the he's... fact he doesn't realize. Obviously, it is what you am. If you're a photographer and you saw some shit going on, even if it were, if it, there's a chance you're going to die, if you're that much into your thing, you're going to pull out your camera and just take, start taking photos. So I get it, but he might possibly be dead. So mm. I don't know why he's looking for his future. Yeah. Anyway, he does that. Well, um, John's very happy, though. He gets very excited because they actually find a walkie that he can actually use. Yeah. And also, let's not mention, let's not forget to mention that on the es- on the Esperanza's plane, because it's approaching, there is now a shootout on that plane, and he sort of takes control of that plane. Yeah, which it, I, I've assumed the way it was going to be in, in movies we see this thing happen. <laughs> Everything gets sucked out of the airplane. That I guess they weren't high enough for that yeah, to happen. Maybe. But still, cabin pressure is being dropped, and it's not good because obviously, I guess eventually he's going to pass out because the pressure's not leveled enough to breathe. I presume. Um, his plane, that plane, cr- sort of crashes and slides along a bit, um, and John heads over. This is where he's underground, Freedom! and he tries to not, get out. Not yet. Oh yeah, yeah that's a really good bit. A horrible bit. This so he's, he's trying to get out from under that grate, and the plane's just the plane's coming, coming along towards him. him. Towards him, he looks up. It just pushes the grate up with his head. Looks up, and the, basically the front wheel of the plane is on the on the floor. It's going to actually hit, rolled over his head, and he's just trying to get up this heavy grate. 
I would almost gone back down, let the plane go I across and gone, gone up. It seems silly, but then again, but it's an action movie. He gets out and gets on the plane. No, the guy, um, the guy who comes out, opens the door, says, freedom. And he says, not yet. And knocks him, <laughs> knocks him out. And then he gets on the plane and the baddies arrive and they say, that's not good. John McClane, consider this. What does he say? Consider this a soldier's Mil- mil- funeral or something. funeral or something like that. And, and they just shooting. fill it full of bullets. And then go, we got some grenades for them. He oh, says, give them more. Well, he says, man, have you got your grenades? And they all go, we've got three each. And he says, wow. use them all. So there's like 10 men there and they all got three grenades. They all bung them in the plane. So John thinks, oh, fuck. And then he sees a little thing on the behind the seat that says ejector seat. And he thinks... I know what I'm going to have to do here. So he jumps in the seat, and he's literally got seconds. Pulls the ejector seat lever, blasts out of the plane. And you got that shot of him coming up. It is, it's obviously like a rear projector, so I it looks a little bit a sketchy, brilliant. but it, it is a great shot. Oh, Jay said how great he, that, he loves that shot. Yeah. When I first saw that scene, I thought, I don't, I remember thinking, or maybe I we, even turned to my dad and I said, I don't think like, there'll ever be an, a stunt better than that. That's. I remember seeing that and thinking that was the best stunt that there was ever going to be, ever. I can't wait. I let Jay watch Die Hard for the first time last year, but I can't wait for Elijah when I start showing him 80s action movies. I can't <laughs> wait. Same with you, Jack. Well, that, that plane blows up, and for a split second, William Sadler and his buddies don't realise that John um, ejected out of it, and they just think he's dead. Then they see him slowly in the background in a parachute, and they're like lucky escape uh, and and then the the cops turn up so they get in their 4 by 4s and they drive off oh Walter Peck again is now in the loo oh yeah well he says I'm going to be sir she's like sir you need to sit down we're about to land but he's going like, to go live I'm about to go live baby um, Barnes figures out um, well, I don't get how but he's like John can I speak to you a minute and he's like yeah what is it and he's like randomly I've got this map and I've just figured out that there's some buildings here and don't worry about it because it moves the film forward but there's a church and I reckon that's where everybody is let's go to the church and John's like let's do it <laughs> it doesn't matter it moves the plot along it doesn't uh, really matter and they find out it is it is oh uh, this is a great this is this bit now it's like a different film now because we're at the airport yeah so they go to this church and he sees that guy maybe he's just uh, what does he say maybe he's just out like, on patrol, and he's like, "Well, no, he's on patrol. So he's walking backwards and forwards yeah, on his own yeah, footsteps." Yeah, yeah. So John jumps over and he gets into the fight with this guy, and it's a really brutal scene. Actually, he's fighting the guy. The guy's about to stab him. And John grabs an ice school, and it's like something out of like um, Black Christmas or something because it goes straight in his eye. It's a, it's almost like a horror movie kill, isn't it? Yeah, and when it melts, so it's just going to have this squashed eyeball. Ugh. It's nice. The army shows up. In their white snow camo. All uh, nice and icy white. And uh, they break into the church, but there's C4 everywhere. So the baddies have left, and they're about to blow the church up. Yeah. So so, so this is quite risque, really, though, isn't it? Because they, they, the, the army guys already knew that there was going to be explosives going to be going off soon. But they wanted them to say, look, the explosives, we've got to get out. But are they real explosives? Probably not, because the baddies also switch yeah. to, to blue cartridges, which, as we find out a bit later but on, do we, are we blanks. Don't, we don't see the... Uh, but they do need to blow it up anyway, though, because of the fact that... Yeah, maybe it is. They can take back control of the air, the tower again. Well, but, they, but they've got what they've wanted, so it, really it shouldn't matter. So maybe they don't. So maybe you're right, because we don't see the church actually blow up. None of this matters, Gav, because we're about to see one of the most 90s things you'll ever see, which is a snow ski chase. Have you ever ridden a snowmobile? No, but this is... They are fun. So 90s now. Snowmobiles chasing each other around. Men in white, like, you know, Star Wars, like when they're on Hoth, those kind of suits, shooting at each other. John McClane on one of them. He steals one of them as well. And he's trying to drive it along. And it's just, this is, the, I looked at this scene and I just thought, this is a 1990 film, 100% through and through. Yeah. Absolutely love it. Great stuff. Um, there's a bit of a shootout in the snow. They think they've killed him. 
definitely killed him. And then the bad, the um, army are all in the back of that van. Well, John McClane doesn't understand though. He's got a machine gun. He shoots them as well. Later on, he doesn't. He realizes though, doesn't he? He says, "I yeah. had him right in my sights." Yeah. So in the back of the back of the Marines van, they're all joking around, and he's one of the. There's one guy. And he says, <laughs> man, I really kind of, I wish I could have been with you guys in whatever mission it was. And um, one of them says, it's a shame you weren't because then I wouldn't have to do this. And he just slices this. Again, it's a real horror movie kill. And you're like, oh, shit. At this point, that was when I remember thinking, no, they're baddies. Yeah. Crazy. Yeah. Um, it was such a shame for that poor kid. But uh, yes, so um, he's not as corrupt as them. But um, the news team's going live. Walter Peck. He, he calls the studio and they say, "Right, we're going live in five minutes. We got we got the news story of the year here." So they just they just go for it, and he's basically saying, "I'm on a plane. There's loads of planes above the airport. Terrorists have taken over. This might be my last ever report." But you know who I am. I'm going to win the Pulitzer Prize. I'm going to win this, that, and the other. And he's just a dick, an absolute dick. Back at the airport, John pulls a risky move. Fucking hell, he does because he says, he says, look at this, and he says what? And he just pulls a machine gun on that cop and, and blasts it, him. Yeah, and just starts shooting around. And the guys are like, what the fuck? Everyone's like, whoa! And he's like, they're blanks, they're blanks. Now, wow. most cops would have shot him dead. Absolutely. Why didn't anybody shoot him dead? <laughs> Do I? Well, we wouldn't have had four more Die Hard movies after this if that was the case. This is true. Maybe we shouldn't. Maybe they should have shot him dead. Uh, uh, not not four more because there's only five. Uh... Well, I count the advert that he was in for the batteries. Right. <laughs> Airport chaos. Absolute airport chaos and because. Shoes. Because Peck's news report is caused a giant riot in the airport. Everybody's escaping the airport now. And that Holly sees this on the news. It's no good for the airplane. So let's get old Granny's dildo, I mean Taser, and let's get to Fucking the bathroom. Hell. Yeah, what does she do? T- she, she zaps him. Does she, does she taser him in the pack? I don't know. No, it's just in the stomach. Or wherever I'd, have done, it. I'd yeah. have done it in the balls if I was there. Yeah. Um, yeah, and he's knocked out, instantly knocked out. Um, John uh, See, gets... Is it, well, he sees the news lady, doesn't he? And he says, hey, uh, whatever her name is. And she's like, oh, hi, Mr. McLean. I uh, remember you. Samantha Coleman is her That's it. character's name. And they arrange Coleman! something where... Coleman! They, they arrange something where she gets in the jabber with him and they fly the they fly the helicopter over the plane this is his idea this is where John McClane is John McClane for the reason he is John McClane they're like what would you like to do with this helicopter John how can we possibly save the day fly it at the plane I've just realised I don't know where my die hard for John McClane wife uh, um Vest, I was about to say wife beater. Uh, sorry, that's very, that. very bad terminology for a uh, uh, vest, white vest uh, is. I used to have a beer colder for like what you're drinking right now. I remember that. Yeah, I, I, remember. Don't, know, I don't know where that went. And I, I don't drink anymore anyway. But, but, but yeah, um, the yeah. plan, I love his plan. Brilliant. I just want to fly the helicopter out the plane. And the guy's like, several times, the guy's like, I can't do what you're saying. I can't ram a 250-ton playing with my helicopter and he's like okay um <laughs> not do anything, can it? you can you float above it and he's like yeah and then he's like get it lower and the guy's like i'm trying he's like no get it lower and it's like the rotors are gonna hit against the plane and john's like get it lower and eventually john just jumps onto the wing of the plane it's like what are you thinking you're gonna do john it's hilarious though they have a door here for the airplane what's that uh, door on the wing what I use does that have to anybody i don't know you know. But John John rams his coat into this little flap. It works well for Die Hard too. He rams his coat into the little flap, Which, so the airplane cannot take off. Yeah, because this is one of the little. Um, He's a little flap filler. Air flap things, and uh, this means that they go. Well, we have something's wrong. <gasps> it's McLean. Right. Well, let's go get him. Do it right this time. Oh, don't worry about me. So John. 
kills the first guy that comes out to him. No, you just miss, miss the action. So the guy jumps out, and it's it's the uh, army guy, Grant, where he had this sort of Grant. bonding session with earlier. And um, uh, have a bit of a, a, a tussle, tuffle, a tussle? Not a tuffle, or a truffle, a tussle. They have a truffle. And, they sit and, down and they have a little truffle. And the army together. guy's hanging off... The wing right in front of like the turbine, like the motor. Oh, the, the, yeah. And just put, falls into it, <laughs> splat, red blood out the back of the aeroplane. That's a bit of an Indiana Jones moment, isn't it? So, uh, old uh, Stuart, Colonel Stuart, Willie, Willie Sander, jumps out of his little weird door placement on the aeroplane and now, jumps down to, with a knife. I wanted him to take his clothes off at this point. He does do a 360, uh, do like a 360 kick to, uh, and which John ducks for him to quickly switch round to a 360 sweeping low kick and take him out, which I quite he like. Is, he is a bit of a badass. He's quite and quick, I isn't he? I He's don't like know a Street how John, character. John, who clearly smokes a lot, Drinks a lot he's of coffee. Keeping up with it. Yeah, he's, yeah. He doesn't. He's not really in shape. No. But do no. you know what? Who cares? It's John McLean. So yeah, he, he has noticed though the 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 fuel outlet. Yes. So he pulls that down. Is he? I think his whole goal is to be knocked about and not like to get yeah. over to that. Yeah. You know, because John, we know John can take a punch or two. Well, he's seen it when he see, he saw that and then he got back up as a fight. But he knew that he should have gone for it there and then just done it. He knows there's no way he can fight and beat this guy, so he thinks, well, the only thing I can do is be knocked enough over towards this fuel it's gauge where I can rip though, the panel off. That he's going to be beat forward towards that way, though. But anyway, but he does it. He does it, and he pulls the um, pulls the fuel gauge so open thing, just, the, the valve open, and the fuel just starts going everywhere. And then. Uh, Colonel Stewart gets back on the plane. He's very and smug and very pleased. And some and so. all happy. This is where John pulls out a trusty Zippo. We need John McClane with a Zippo. Yeah. Yippee guy, hey, motherfucker. And he just lights it up. And as the plane literally just it takes cool, off the airport, it? It looks really cool. Off the that runway. Boom. And again, the amount of fuel that's on these planes, it just goes up. And again, like you say, Gav, there's no CGI. This is an explosion. I don't know how they there's did this, your but there was a miniature... Light. Holly, there's oh, that, your landing light. He actually says, <laughs> there's, there's your, he actually says, there's your fucking landing night, Holly. And Genius. That is just That's so a, good. That is a Christmas miracle right what there. What I love, what the Christmas miracle line for me in this film is, not not that, it's when you hear all the other planes on the radio going, we can use the fire. Yeah, we can use the fire to see our way in. Yeah. And then somebody says, there are, and somebody says, tell the other planes to do it. And, and he says, chief and commander they're already says, doing they already it. already know. And it's just so good. And they're all just like coming in. You might as well have like a Christmas carol playing while they're all flying in. It's so good. Absolutely. They, uh, yeah, they absolutely love it. And, uh, and they get all in. the planes land. And John there's that searches. amazing shot where the, the smoke, black smoke's coming, the airplane's coming, like making circles. And around. John's running. And it's so, because it's all real, like airplanes coming in on an airport. Uh, obviously, there's probably maybe some rear projector going on and stuff. Um, but John's there just running up and it looks such a great shot. He runs up all Holly, you hear, all Holly, 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 loads and loads of that. And then she sees him. And then they see it, the janitor, it, the janitor picks him up like Al Gol in the, the first Die Hard and the limo. What did what, hey, what, what what you say? <laughs> I'm not cleaning this up. <laughs> Uh, they kiss, he kisses Holly and they drove off and, and that's it. The film crew filmed them and it's let it snow, let it snow. Oh, the weather outside is frightful. <laughs> what a fucking great! And it is a Christmas <laughs> film. Die Hard One and Die Hard Two are both Christmas <laughs> films, man. Let it snow, let it snow, let it snow. Because. A Christmas film should always be a feel feel good at the end, and at the end of this, you do feel good. He's taken down all the yeah. baddies. Yeah. Everyone that you love has survived, Absolutely. and there's a great Christmas tune playing over the credits. I'm happy. I'm happy. Yeah, <laughs> very and very I, happy. I know that I'm going to watch this movie again, so I give it a thumbs up. <laughs> yeah, hundred percent. Give this a thumbs up. Like I said, like, it. what we could do next year though is be nice to discover these uh, action movies. We're doing movies. the Weapon Two next year. <laughs> 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 that is Christmas still, yeah. It's still Christmas, and then after that, we're, we I think we've exhausted a Christmas action films. I think we might be able to do cliffhanger because there's some snowy scenes. No, <laughs> come on, we're, we're yeah. keeping an eye out. There might be something we can do. There might be a few things lying around. We'll we'll see. But yeah, I think Need the Weapon Two is next year. But yeah, there we go. 
Die Hard 2, Die Harder. What a fantastic film. Fucking brilliant Christmas film. We love it. We do. Will you take me to The Strange? Oh, Bill. Didn't see you stood there. You ready for... Uh... Yes, I know. I'm going to watch Ghostbusters Afterlife tomorrow. I thought you were very good in it, Bill. You made me cry. I'm... Okay, right. You said he wants to cross my stream. What does that mean? You'll you find out. Okay. All right, then, well, Bill, let's, let's get going. Hi, welcome back to World of the Strange. World of the Strange. Ho, ho, ho. World of the Strange, boys and girls. World of the Strange. Here we go. So, it's Christmas, Gav. It's Christmas time in Gabby's flat. And everybody knows he's got a hat. Right, so I thought we'd talk about some things, some mishaps. Christmas Christmas mishaps. Mishaps a funny word, isn't it? Mishap. Mishap. So let's let's go through some of these. There's a few of them here. I've got a little list, as you you know I like my lists. Uh let's start with the fact that last year four people broke their arms pulling Christmas crackers. How the fuck? <laughs> Were they old? No, they just did it too hard. But yeah, how do you break an arm? I can I could understand maybe pull out a socket if someone a lot stronger than you that's a really gnarly cracker just went and yanked you about breaking your arm. I don't know. Do they maybe fall over then break it? I know someone who broke her ribs coughing. Wow. Mm. And I thought I thought she would no, that can't be true, but it's apparently it's a very true thing. Um <clears throat> okay, here's another one. A four year old girl put a metal bell inside her ear so she could always listen to jingle bells. Now that's quite sweet, but she had to go to hospital and have it removed surgically. Mm. A imagine. metal bell inside her ear. But how long Okay. <laughs> Must be the little one you got stuck in there. It's one of those little tiny ones. Fuck. A 28-year-old woman was putting up ornaments in her house when she's the bar stool that she was stood on slipped, and all it says is she got vaginal trauma <laughs> from landing on an ornament. It doesn't say what ornament. It doesn't say what happened. That's your imagination. That's the worst thing about it. <clears throat> They're even, leaving that for your imagination. Vaginal t- trauma. Yeah. God. What 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 would be the thing you'd like least like to land on? Me I'm in thinking, general, I w- wouldn't want to land on a cactus. I I would hate no a Christmas thing. Oh, uh, candle. I'd, oh, I'd say like a, a two foot high Santa with a really pointed hat. It's like cat. It's not catchphrase, or it's like that family fortunes. Name five four things that you would not have <laughs> fall on at Christmas. Thirty-one people were injured last year because they watered their Christmas tree, but forgot that the fairy lights were plugged in. Fucking hell! Imagine that. I'm just going to put some water on the tree. I never even thought about that. You wouldn't do that anyway. You'd put water on the on the on the base, obviously. You yeah, but some like it. some people watered it like with a watering can. Almost deserve it. No, sorry, <laughs> sorry, but come Fuck on. Hell. But come they on. Deserve it. Well, you need a fucking lesson, don't you? Think, think sometimes. Just like William William Sadler, you need a lesson. We drop one plane, that'll teach you a lesson. I thought you'd go back to his ball swinging in the air. That's a whole other lesson. A 36-year-old man accidentally swallowed a drawing pin while he's putting up Christmas decorations because he looked up. And sneezed at the same time. And a dream <laughs> pin fell into his mouth and he swallowed it. <laughs> that is unfortunate. Isn't oh, it? what a coincidence. Fucking hell. Swallowing a drawing pin is I not just good. swallowed it, but everyone like, fuck off, did you? I did, I did. Oh, God. 
He looked up and sneezed and swallowed a drawing pin. Oh shit. Bad. And that is not that is not good. You don't want that rolling around your insides, do you? No, you would have to go to the hospital straight away. I don't know how to get it out. I don't know. A magnet? <laughs> uh, no, I, I, oh, I spoke. Oh, I Imagine don't. pulling out a drawing pin. Oh, no, we couldn't let that go through your body because that could really cut you up. And internal bleeding would be bad. Hundred and ninety-one people have been hospitalised since nineteen ninety-seven because they've had to have parts of plastic toys removed from the soles of their feet. I, I, I can relate. The amount of times I've stepped on the kid's shit and just been in agony. Imagine having to go and have it surgically removed. That'd be bad, though. I, I think I heard someone stepping on a plug once, like the, like <sighs> the three pins sticking up, or two if you're in America or wherever. I had and a... Boom, going through your foot. I had a metal matchbox plane. Hmm. Um, might have been a James Bond plane or something when I was very young. And obviously, like the the fin on the tail, hmm. I stood on that, and it went it went into my foot and sliced into my foot. Nice. I had to go and have. I don't know if I had stitches. I was only little. I probably just had a plaster, but really hurt a lot of blood. Not very nice. <laughs> Sorry, the big love. A sixty-four-year-old woman. Mm. Sprained her foot when she dropped a four-foot-tall wooden Santa on it. Uh, yeah, I can imagine. That's yeah. Okay. I don't think anything of that. It's just yeah. All one, right. Well, how about this watering one? Watering Christmas trees, which are plugged in and turned on, is a fucking stupid idea. I don't expect that. How about what, this one? Well, then? I do expect it, but yeah, go on. Fifty-year-old woman standing on a chair. Age Hank. does not matter, surely. Hanging, cr- hanging Christmas lights, and she fell, and struck her rectum. What is it with the? What is it with the falling off into the private branches. parts? So she, she calls fell, the, what? She calls the rectal tear by landing on the tree branches of the Christmas tree. She her tree branches went up Rip, her bottom, ripped her rectum, rectum ripping Christmas tree, <laughs> rectum ripping time. I'm going to go out and have a reptum ripping time. <laughs> oh, my God. <laughs> oh, God, that sounds like a rapist motto, doesn't it? Oh, my God. Five people were injured last year as they were struck in the head by scare electrics cars flying off the track. <laughs> What's... Oh, look at it go, Billy. <laughs> <laughs> Dad, are you all right? Sorry, Dad. I'm sorry. Dad. Over 50 people were injured last year as a Dad. result of using a knife instead of a screwdriver for to what? put batteries or assemble new toys for their children. Oh, see, that fucking the amount of years at Christmas, I've just been like, oh, I've just what used have you knife. got? And they've handed me like this box, and it's like, right, for the next two hours then, I've got to sit here putting this shit together. Yep. And then they play with it for ten minutes, and they can't be bothered. But don't use a knife because you'll end but up in you, hospital. No, but you get to the point you're like, oh, what's around me? Because I can't be bothered. And you start using like a knife to unscrew. I, I've used a spoon before. You do these things. But personally, I am a DIY person, so I, I've got toolboxes. So. 19 people last year went to hospital uh, after mistaking Christmas decorations for chocolates. <laughs> <laughs> Mum, can I have one of these? Because they're hanging on the tree. So you know, like, you get chocolates hanging on the tree. Can you imagine you get old folks or come along and say, Oh, what's this? And they're just chewing glass. You're like, Grandma, oh. you're bleeding. What, so what flavour is it then? No, no you're I bleeding. Can't. Your gums bleeding gums. I can't feel my gums. Yeah, they're bleeding everywhere. A 66-year-old man working at home was left dizzy because the wind outside blew him around and around. What? <laughs> he went outside and he said it was very windy and the wind blew him around and around. And they called the, the ambulance and he got taken to hospital and they said, what happened? And he said, the wind blew me round and round. That's, that's a very weird thing to happen at Christmas and it's a weird thing to be like... It doesn't... I don't know, it seems very odd. 
It's not very major. It's very minor, but it seems a bit strange. During Christmas, every year, around 80,000 people go to hospital for injuries such as falls, cuts, and burns. Merry Christmas, everybody. Merry Christmas. So I think the takeaway from all of this, Gav, is look out for your asshole when you're putting things up. Wear your, wear your metal underpants. Wear metal underpants. Don't sneeze when you're putting drawing pins up on things. And don't let the wind blow you round and round. Yeah. What was your, uh, what was your funniest one? What was your worst one? Of those? Yeah. Worst is obviously going to be a, 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 a rectum <laughs> tearing, isn't it, really? Uh, a favourite? I don't know. What would be yours? I think my favourite is probably, because it's quite specific, scale electrics cars. That is a good one. Flying off the track. And you can picture the, that. And, and it's, it's going to be it's the quite bad. Harmless, it's quite it's a harmless It's going to be the bad. That I, think, the I think maybe an old person eating, eating, some, eating a decoration. <laughs> Breaking their teeth. Just crunching it up. <laughs> this, oh. this candy crap. <laughs> it tastes like blood. Grandma, it's blood. It's your blood. <laughs> stuff. Have you ever injured yourself at Christmas? I'm sure I have. I can't think of anything particularly. Oh, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, I think when I got my new bike, BMX, and went riding in it, and I fucking just put my feet through the fucking front spokes and went over the handlebars, smashed my face into the ground, blood all over me. That's funny, because I did the same thing with a skateboard. Uh... But on it's Boxing Day, it was a day after, and I thought, there's a really steep hill near my parents. And I thought, I'm going to go to the top of this hill, and I'm going to sit on the skateboard and go down the pavement. Mm -hmm. And gravity just sent me straight towards a lamppost. Yeah. Black eye. I used to like it at Christmas when I had to get like a, a bike occasionally, once in a while. It would always be at my grandparents' house, and it would be so exciting to go for a ride on my bike. I think roller skates were my favorite, one of my favourite things. I'm not a roller skate, I'm a skateboarder, dude. Yeah, I had a skateboard too, but I loved getting my roller skates because I thought it was so cool. Like there we go. Disco Dan. Disco Dan. Well, there we go, Bill. That was World of the Strange. Thanks, Please Bill. take us out of here. Ho, ho, ho. Ho, ho, ho. That's all the time we've got for this week on World of the Strange. Next week, though, give me Ira. Hairless pets. Weird. And welcome back, ladies and gentlemen, non-gendered people, ghouls, ghosts, vampires, werewolves, satanic people of disposition. Uh, and good, abominable good, good, snowmen. Good satanic people and anyone else that's welcome with us. Welcome. And, were and werewolves who are actually just killers in suits. Father Christmas. And William Sadler's bollocks. Welcome, everybody, back to the outro. Back for the final time. Mm-hmm. Hope it's our last one, it. actually. It's our last episode of 2021. Yeah, not our last one ever. Not our last one ever, although, you know, sometimes it feels like that because we've vanished for months at a time. But we're back now. Mm. Well, you should you should get an episode at least once a month. Yeah, we're, we're at least once a month. We, we aim for every three weeks, but um, life. We'll just see what it is. So, yeah, life. Yeah, yeah. But good one, that one. Uh, uh, yeah, all, all, my, all my kids had COVID, you know. So I know, man, that's crazy. You, yeah. you, and I, I don't know how you didn't. Well, I drank out of the same receptacle as Jay, who had been drink, uh, who had what had COVID at the time, and uh, I didn't have COVID. I never got it. Well done. You are superhuman. And that's weird. But yeah, always love our Christmas episodes. Always have done the. Those and the Halloween episodes are obviously my favourites. I love our birthday ones, but something about the Christmas one. Um, I hope that next year maybe we can get together for a Christmas one because it's been a couple of years since we've been able to do it because of bloody pandemics and shit. But uh, mm. still, die hard to, you know, always fun to talk about Bruce Willis and these these action films. And I'm really glad to hear that I was worried that you wouldn't be as into The Wolf of Snow Hollow. Um, but it sounds like you were just a few points behind me on that one so i'm glad that you like that one too mm. 
a great movie. We'll think of what we're going to do next year. I think we are going to do Lethal Weapon 2. Um, and there's lots of other Christmas films out there. Um, is You know that new one that's come out? I think you've seen it. It's called a Werewolf Among Us. Is that one set at Christmas? That is a murder mystery werewolf film. It's funny that these two werewolf movies came out at the same time. Um, that is... Hmm, no, but it is wintry, I feel like. Um, and okay. that, that film, again, um, I think Wolf's, Wolf of Snow Hollow, I prefer more than that one. And that one... I started off okay, and then for some reason went downhill. But then again, I should just give it another try. Um, to be fair, it wasn't a bad werewolf film in the day and age where we did we we struggled to have good werewolf films. So. Yeah, I don't know why we don't get them. Listeners, please, if you a can think of a good Christmas horror film we haven't covered, or a Christmas action film that sort of has some good violence in it, give us a shout on the old Facebook, or you can email us uh, the podcast on Haunted Hill at uh, gmail.com um, or uh, if you can think of any um, werewolf films good new werewolf films that we haven't seen and we haven't talked about let us know because we love werewolf we crave a good werewolf film there just aren't any out there Indeed. it's a shame mm-hmm. but yeah so what have we got coming up next I hear you say it's my birthday as always January is your birthday Gavin and you you mentioned to me a while ago that you had an idea to combine the British carry on smutty comedy style of film with horror. And luckily you also had some suggestions. What are your suggestions for us to cover in our next episode? We're gonna do the Frankie Howard movie, a uh, Nightmare in uh no, House in Nightmare Park. House in Nightmare Park, which sounds like a great great horror film anyway but it's a comedy horror a british comedy horror yeah and the other one um what's the other one called what a carve up what's a carve up uh, i've only seen i only discovered this movie very recently hence me forgetting the name just then um um really enjoyed it and also another couple of carry on characters and we will discuss the carry on uh films so for anyone who doesn't know and what they um, are yeah the carry on but just to give a brief we'll do it properly in the next episode but carry on movies were very popular in the 60s and 70s in britain they're very smutty almost benny hill it was like style ca- humor carry on camping carry on uh, at your convenience carry on yeah. the name was carry on and it'd be saying uh, and then it'd be like a movie and it always had the same sort of cast playing but just different roles but they always kind of the same sort of roles and it's very it's very cheeky very like it's, it's, British seaside humour. Yes, adult, but child-friendly too. Uh, yeah. Lots yeah. of sort of boob references and very pervy. It's, Probably you wouldn't imagine, fly very well. In this as you stage. can imagine, we grew up on the humour, hence yeah. why the show is like it is. <laughs> but yeah, so, and also this show, the next episode, will actually be a bit of a follow-up to an episode we did many years ago where we covered... Carry On Screaming, which is a Carry On movie, which was a horror movie. And we also covered that along with Kenny Everett's movie, which is called... What was it called? Doc, oh, what was the Kenny Everett movie called? Uh, the House of... Um, the Bloodbath at the House, House of Death. Death mm. Which is, again, a great title. So mm. another couple of smutty British comedy horrors. So yeah, great to come back to that kind of thing. They are fun. There is going to be some jokes that don't fly as well this day and age, but... We're all we're big enough and ugly enough to understand that. So that's what's coming up next. That'll be episode 117. Drop in sometime in January to celebrate young Gavin's birthday. Mm. As mm. always. Gavin, have you got anything you want to say to our listeners before we, we wrap up the show? Um, Obviously, Merry I hope Christmas you, to everybody. I hope you enjoyed today's show. And um, uh, thanks for staying with us. And um, if you're new to the show, pl- welcome. Um, please, please subscribe, like, follow, review, rate, all that jazz. All and the jazz. we shall carry on doing the things. But everyone be safe out there and be happy in this world. It is a weird world. And the pandemic comes and goes, comes and goes. It's pretty much on the way out. But we wish you all safe and happy and healthy Christmases and we hope that it's much better than last year where we know a lot of people couldn't get to see their loved ones so hopefully this year you get to sit down and have a bit of turkey with your loved ones or a pull a cracker or just even have a glass of red wine whatever it is you do for Christmas or pull a turkey you can pull a turkey if you want bit of an odd thing to say Gav but 
if that's what you like, then that's what you like. Gav and I are both rocking on Christmas. I really like the fact we're both wearing Christmas jumpers for this. Yeah, I was going to write another one, but I was like, no, I'll go represent the Wu Tang Christmas jumper. Got your Wu Tang Christmas. And I've got my dad Christmas jumper on here, which is actually my dad's jumper that he gave me, as you can tell from the design. It's very, I think he probably wore this a lot in around about 84, 85, I would Amazing. say. Amazing. Amazing. I'm, I'm still wearing it now. And what I love about it is, and this is a bit, a bit of a sentimental thing, but there's a bit here that ripped. We're quite clearly, it's got my mum's stitching so it's my a bit of my mum in this jumper as well because there's some stitching here where she would have sewn it up for him at some point That's bless nice. her and yeah. bless him yeah. so yeah rocking the christmas jumpers well we'll wrap the show up then with a bit of admin and then we'll say our goodbyes and uh, say our good evenings and good nights to you all so as always we're a proud member here at the podcast on on today we're a proud member of the legion podcast network uh, find out more about them by visiting legionpodcast.com where you'll find out all about the other shows um you can find out more about legion if you just visit facebook and go to the legion podcast page that's where we're most active on facebook so go to the podcast on haunted hill just search that you'll find out there um you can find out more about us on any platforming or podcatcher as they call it uh spotify youtube um iTunes, whatever it's called these days. You can find us wherever you listen to us right now. That's where you can find us. We're pretty much available anywhere. If there's somewhere you can't find us, let us know. And we'll try and figure out how to make it available there. Um, we're on Twitter, at Haunted Podcast. We're on Instagram, at the uh, Podcast on Haunted Hill Insta. Uh, we have an email address as well, which, as I mentioned earlier, is the Podcast on Haunted Hill at Outlook.com. If you want to find out more about Deadbolt Films, which is our production company, deadboltfilms.com. Again, there's a channel on YouTube for Deadbolt Films. Just type in Deadbolt Films. Deadbolt Films are on Instagram. It's just Deadbolt Films, all one word. And Twitter, at Deadbolt Films. And on Patreon, if you want to support us, and you, we, we never ask anyone to do it, but we do have several patrons, which we will talk about in just a moment, um, then just do, go to Patreon and type in the podcast on Haunted Hill. Anything that you can help with, even if it's just a dollar or a pound a month, will really, really help the show. Um, and also it means we can get more merchandise like t-shirts and mugs with the logo on it and give that to you guys as patrons you also get exclusive content which at the moment is us chucking out the old shows from eight years ago every friday freaky friday we've called it um i'm chucking out and publishing the old mm. shows right from the beginning. we just published episode eight today um which was my birthday episode from 2014 i do Alec. apologize for the show <laughs> for shows well, in general the sound the quality ones. was a bit rough back then but we grew we're growing you know so yeah and uh, you'll get exclusive content sometimes video content and a few other bits um so yeah if you want to join us on there and as always thank you to our patrons we can't thank you guys enough um for for the love that you show us and you guys are definitely i'm about to read out the names but you guys are all definitely on our christmas list and not the naughty list unless of course you want to be on the naughty list and dan and i regardless will be coming down your chimneys on christmas eve to give you all ah. a little present oh yeah so thank you very much to don collier matthew godley jill smith Jamie Jenkins, Kevin S. Fife, Sarah Kay, Rachel, Josh Myers, uh, RJ McCready, and Lex Boo. And talking of Matthew Godley... Thank you, everybody. Thank you all very much. Yeah. Talking of Matthew Godley, he actually had a question for us. Oh, brilliant. Um, which was... I'll read it out verbatim. Just finished watching A Christmas Story... The one where the boy gets a BB gun for Christmas. Matthew, I must let you know that this is one of my favourite Christmas films of all time. You all shoot your eye out, etc., etc. Um, he says, what was your favourite present you got for Christmas when you were a kid? Oh, oh it's very hard to, to remember, really. There's, there's going to be multiple toys over multiple years, really. It's going to be I the know, time when it, I, I got think yours Star was, Wars and stuff. No, I think yours was your Rambo knife wasn't it i did love my rambo she gun your rambo knife. Knife. Yes, I see. Yeah. he had the rambo machine gun with the pump action to it as well and we the, had the, the knife, knife had a little compass in it. it had it and a little stuff inside it yeah and yeah. I, I threw it at my friend and it hit him in the eye <laughs> you did yeah that's the one i got in trouble yeah that was a good one is that your favorite do you think i don't know there's more oh, i remember one one year getting a, a horror makeup kit Oh wow! Mm, that was super cool as a kid, you know. I think I had something like that. Yeah, we all sort of did at one point, I think. Yeah. Mm. Oh, nice, man! Oh, really cool. Mm. 
Uh, I think my I, present. I Go will. On. Well, at my folks next. Um, I'll see if I can put out the uh, photo books and see if I can find some pictures of me as a kid with toys around me of the of the time and I'll, I'll take some snapshots and I'll put them up on the Facebook page. Oh, nice. Yeah, yeah. I've got I've got a couple like that. So I think I got two. I think I might have two answers. One of them was. I was about five years old, and I got Castle Grayskull. I've mentioned this before, but just the sheer size of the box that it came in mm. compared to me as a five-year-old. Because mm. that, that came out in 83, I think, 84. So maybe, I don't know, maybe I was about six when I it came I, out. I, did I have Castle Grayskull? I don't know. If, maybe. But the sheer size of the box, and then my dad spent hours helping me put it together um i had boulder hill you know mask oh yeah mask boulder hill that was a good one mm. and i've got a photo somewhere that of plastic me boulder that came off you press the button and it just rolled down mm. i've got a photo somewhere of me sat behind castle grayskull like it was my own little fortress and it just dwarfed me because i was a kid and it was just like this is the best thing ever but i think the other really amazing present i got was a bit older i was about nine or ten maybe even no, it was about 9 or 10. I got a Sega Master System. Oh, that nice. year, that was the year I didn't speak to anybody for about four months because I just had, I had about four games in my room and I just was glued. Yo, know, that's like my kids now. You know, in, 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 don't speak to me ever. Just play games. Amazing. Mm. So Amazing. Yes, yes, indeed. Right, okay, let's wrap this up, man. Well, there we go then. Is so it, that's it, Christmas. Uh, Thank you, Matthew, for your question. Gav, it's yeah. a good night. Uh, well, yeah. Thank you for coming. Thank you for uh, being patrons. Thank you so 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 much. It means the world to us that you enjoy listening to our voices, which is a crazy concept, really. Uh, it's a uh, good night from um, uh, William Sadler's testicles. It's a good night, and it's a merry Christmas from a very tall, skinny man who enjoys dressing up as a werewolf. It's a very good night, and a merry Christmas from Bruce Willis as a microwave uh, meal. And it's a, a very good a night. TV dinner. It's a very good night and a Merry Christmas from Jim Cummings. Love it and Cummings coming soon. Ooh. Oh, Gav? Uh, yes, uh, too much ejaculative conversation in this. Uh, Merry Christmas just to Merry you, Christmas. Gav. Merry Christmas to you. Merry Christmas to all of you guys. Uh, have a real safe one, what we do. Don't get too drunk. Don't drink and drive. Don't do heroin and drive either. And hopefully we'll be rocking out episodes enough that in a year's time we'll be saying happy ninth anniversary to the podcast on today, which is crazy. If we hit ten years, that'll be ten nuts. years podcasting. I can't believe we've been eight years podcasting. Isn't That's that very... strange? It's... That is strange. Some dedication, my friend. Dedication. Yeah, fucking great. It means you've put up with me talking absolute shit for two, three hours. It, the door swings both ways. Yeah, your door swings both ways. Take care, everybody. Be safe. Die harder. Thank you for listening to the podcast on Haunted Hill. We will be back again real soon.